At PNC Park in Pittsburgh, Pix 11 Sports presents New York Mets baseball. Today, the Mets play the Pittsburgh Pirates. And a pleasant good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Pittsburgh. Gary Cohen, Ron Darling with you today as the Mets play game three of their four-game series against the Pirates. Pittsburgh has won the first two games of the series, but even in the loss last night, the Mets' bullpen, which has been revamped since the start of the season, showed why it now is one of the real strengths of this ball club. You know, since the beginning of May when they made that change, their ERA has gone down a run. Edgen has been great. He's retired 20 of the first 20 hitters he's faced. The first hitter he's faced, Familia has been equally as good as he's gotten better and better, can pitch on more consecutive days. Henry Mejia last night, after they chased around Josh Harrison for about a half hour, was unbelievable in getting through that inning somehow, some way. So the bullpen for the Mets so far has been an incredible strength, but still, they're struggling late in games. Mets have lost three games in a row, and they'll have to play today again without David Wright, who had an MRI today on his left shoulder. Results not yet determined we should find out sometime tonight whether David will be out a short period of time or a longer one. John Neese has been the Mets most consistent starting pitcher this year. He'll take the mound this afternoon. Well he's been fantastic all 15 of his starts and dating back to last year 19 straight of three earned runs or less. You see he got that win in Miami. He has been more outstanding of course than his four and four record is ERA 2.78 in a Negro League tribute. The Mets are wearing the uniforms of the Brooklyn Royal Giants. The Pirates are wearing the Pittsburgh Crawfords uniform and Garrett Cole dons that this afternoon. Well Garrett Cole for you folks at home. He is the Matt Harvey of the Pittsburgh Pirates. A number one draft pick. He has been unbelievable. Won a game last year in the postseason. Sometimes can throw up to 100 miles an hour. Just coming back from the disabled list today after sitting out the last three weeks with shoulder fatigue. So it's the Mets and Pirates. The Mets trying to make their mark in the Steel City after losing the first two. All the action coming your way on Picks 11. Then our crack staff has come up with a nice pirate theme. <laughs> David Wright should be back probably later tonight having the MRI t this afternoon. The record see the ERA much better than with the other catchers. And our 11 and 6 record with Polanco. 
Check out the starting lineup for the Mets. Brought to you by Toyota. Let's go places. Pitcher in the eight hole, which has become something of a fashion for Terry Collins when he's got Nice on the mound. So Eric Young gets the start in the nine hole. Eric Campbell again subs for David Wright. Kirk Neuenheis gets the start in center field with Juan Lagares getting the day off after playing the first two days off the disabled list. Well, Gary Cole was 10 and 7 last year after being brought up for 19 starts, 6 and 3 this year with 12 starts, and he is outstanding. See his numbers so far. He doesn't walk many. He'll give up hits per innings. He doesn't strike out as many you'd think for a guy who throws as hard as Garrett. Look at the defense brought to you by Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Harrison, the hero last night in left field, McCutcheon, Polanco, and right, Alvarez, Mercer. Walker and Gabby Sanchez over Ike Davis because of Nice throwing and Chris Stewart getting the start. He's caught Garrett Cole four times this year. This will be his fifth. It's a warm, humid day in Pittsburgh. Temperature in right around 87 degrees as we approach game time. Shadows will be an issue later in the game with the four o'clock start if the sun stays out, which it is supposed to. Something to be dealt with later. When we mentioned it. At the top of the broadcast, the Mets are wearing the uniforms of the Brooklyn Royal Giants. Now, they were not one of the more prominent Negro League teams in New York. Those were the New York Black Yankees and the New York Cubans who played in the Negro American League and the Negro National League. But the New York Royal Giants were an independent team founded in 1905. And before the uh, more established Negro Leagues were formulated, they were a more preeminent team back in the 19. Aughts in the 19 teams. Well, Smokey Joe Williams is a guy that's in the Hall of Fame, just an amazing pitcher. Cannonball Dick Redding. Here's the wonderful pictures in the day of the Royal Giants. You know, they tended to play uh, some of their games at Dexter Park in Queens, so didn't always play their games in Brooklyn. And Curtis Granderson. It's a very blue uniform, I have to say. I mean, that's. It's about as much blue as you can ever put in one uniform combination. Blue jerseys, blue pants, blue socks. Here at Cole's first pitch to Curtis Granderson is pulled foul and we're underway. Granderson 0 for 8 in this series came in red hot but has cooled a bit here in Pittsburgh. He did hit two balls to the fence in center field in last night's game both of which were caught by Andrew McCutcheon one play better than the other. And Cole misses inside with the fastball at 96, one and one. As far as the uniform is concerned, I think the last time I've seen anything like this was the Cleveland Indians in the day. Frank Robinson, when they had the matching tops and bottoms. They wore those. Uh, those uh, red uniforms, yes. the blood red Indians uniforms. The change up there from Cole, fastball, slurve, change up. One and two to Granderson with Tejada and Murphy to follow in the opening inning. And Curtis pulls one down to first. Gabby Sanchez handles it. And that's the first out of the day. So one out and nobody on. As for the Pirate uniforms, they were wearing the uniform of the Pittsburgh Crawfords, a very prominent Negro League team. There were two big Negro League teams in Pittsburgh, the, the Pittsburgh Crawfords. And the Homestead Grays and Josh Gibson considered the best catcher in Negro League history and maybe the best ever played for both of the Pittsburgh teams. Well the, the Grays are interesting because if they had a W on the side of their jersey that's when they were in D.C. in mm -hmm. Washington. So the Grays played both in Washington and in Pittsburgh. Here's Ruben Tejada two for seven in this series. Tejada on a hot streak last 27 games has a 412 on base percentage. And with the Mets having to revamp their lineup these last two days with David Wright out, Murphy moves into the third spot, and Tejada has taken over the two hole. Well, the one thing when I watch Ruben, see where his toes are? They're as close, he's as close to the plate as he's ever been as a Met. Uh, and also, he's done what uh, he did in that year when he hit 285. His stroke has gotten much shorter. He's just trying to hit line drives. Occasionally, he'll get still get big, but less often than he was early in the season. That's as close to the plate as you're going to get anybody in today's game. So you would think that a pitcher 
looking at that would want to rush the ball inside on. But that's where Tejada really wants it because the third baseman usually plays in or off the line and he wants to pull something down the third baseline. And he does pull one through the hole of base hit for Tejada. So Ruben continues to stroke it well and the Mets have the first base runner of the day. They continue to play him in with the third baseman. So this pitch is really down middle and he does exactly what he's supposed to do. Hit it hard on the ground, maybe find a hole. Playing him in, the third baseman Alvarez, no chance to get that in the hole. So one out and one on. Now Daniel Murphy. Murphy three for nine in this series. Continues to lead the National League in base hits with 97. Today is um, it's hump day in the Major League Baseball season for the Mets. Game number 81 today. So the Mets will have played half their schedule after today. Which makes it really easy to look at how a player has performed and project a full season's worth of statistics. Yeah, double it up, right? Mm -hmm. So Murphy at 97 hits. Gets three today. He'll be uh, right on the pace for 200. I think he'd like that. Yes, he would. <laughs> Teada at first with one out. And Murphy pulls one down the line. Foul. This Garrett Cole, and I usually don't say this because Teada doesn't have great speed. He takes forever to deliver the ball to home plate. So you can at any time with anyone on the a field other than maybe Lucas or others steal a base. Well, the numbers will bear that out. Cole's given up 15 stolen bases this year in 17 tries. Only two pitchers in the majors have given him more steals than he has. And remember, he hasn't pitched in more than three weeks. Murphy fouls back the 98 mile an hour fastball. Notice that Murph's helmet keeps coming off. He's a little bigger swing for the Murph here in the three hole. Is that or a bigger helmet? Maybe he's got Bartolo's helmet on. You know Murph of all the players sports that uniform pretty well like he's got the body style of the players that maybe played in days gone by. Oh two from Cole. And he breaks one low one ball two strikes. Lucas Duda waiting on deck. Another full house here in Pittsburgh. They've had sell out crowds each of the first two games of this series. Pirates are playing their best baseball of the year. They won six of seven. They've moved a couple of games over 500 after a dreadful start to their year. Murphy lifts one into shallow center, and McCutcheon comes on to call and puts it away. Two out. <laughs> McCutcheon's going with the flipping the lid up. Then he's got like the white Oakleys to go with it, so he's uh, old and new. Oh, he's flipping the 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 brim of the hat up. Is that is that just a styling thing? It's absolutely not cool on everybody in baseball except him. He can pull it off, man. Or just about anything else he wants. That's right. When you're the MVP, <laughs> he set the trends. That's right. So here's Duda, and the Pirates put the full shift on against him. Lucas two for eight in the series. A homer and three RBIs had the only two RBIs for the Mets last night. A fourth inning single that played at a pair, and then the Mets did not score for the final seven innings in what turned out to be an 11 inning loss. So, due to with eight RBIs in his last five games, three home runs in those last five games, and he lines one into center field, and he's got a base hit. Tejada pulls in at second, and so the Mets have two men aboard here against Cole in the first. Again, just like his RBI situation yesterday, aggressive on that first pitch. That was a good fastball by Cole, but Duda is so strong, even hitting off the end of the bat, he got a line drive to center field. So two out and two on. Now Aaron Campbell. Campbell filled in for David Wright last night, went one for five, and back in there at third base again today. The Mets are very short of infielders. With Wright not here, they basically do not have a backup infielder. The only other guy they've got on the roster who can play the infield at all is Eric Young, who's played some second base in his career. 
Campbell takes low and away ball one. So depending on what the news is going to be on on right, the Mets will probably have to make some kind of move unless he's ready to play in the next day or two. You just can't play that shorthanded on the infield. It really constricts what Terry Collins can do. Campbell shoots one foul, one and one. So you're telling me that Eric Campbell, if he starts a ball game, cannot come out of the ball game. Well, the only way he could come out, you could move Murphy to third and play Eric Young at second. Okay. But then you're left without any backup infielder at all. No, but I'm saying come out of the game because who's going to back up to Hada if he were to get hurt? Well, Terry Collins was asked today whether maybe Jacob DeGrom could play shortstop. He said, no. He We're not, not going to be doing that. He laughed it off. <laughs> Campbell dribbles one foul, and it's one and two. Everyone has been, there's a couple of the writers that have been kind of pushing for that scenario of DeGrom being a, I, I, I don't know if they know that the level of playing shortstop <laughs> in this league and college ball is light years. I mean, light years. You think? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, everybody was a shortstop at some time exactly. of their life. Come on. You're playing in the big leagues. You probably were a shortstop in Little League and Babe Ruth League or somewhere along the way. One and two to Campbell with two out and two on. And Eric hits the curveball over the bag. That's a fair ball going down the line. Tejada will score due to racing for third as Harrison gets to it. Pulling into second with an RBI double is Eric Campbell and the Mets jump out to a one nothing lead. They started the towels early here. Nice job by Eric Campbell. He stays back on the slider. And Cole leaves in the middle of the plate. Two beautifully directed hits so far. To hottest ground ball to the left of Alvarez. And the ground ball by Campbell to his right. First run of the game brought to you by the New York Lottery. Hey, you never know. Sixth double, eighth RBI for Campbell. And the Mets jump out to an early lead. And now Kirk Neuenheis getting the start in center field. Just the fifth game he started this year. Last one Sunday in Miami had a couple of doubles and an RBI. Bats here with a chance to do some damage. Second and third and two out. And Kirk takes it wide for ball one. And we've got Garrett Cole who hasn't pitched in 25 days. Did not have a rehab start. He was coming off shoulder fatigue. They pitched him in a simulated game instead of a rehab assignment. And looking a little bit less than full strength in the first inning. Yeah, his fastball command is not good so far. Not even close. So the Mets try to take advantage as they did the the first time they faced him last year as new and high stakes ball one. Last year the Mets faced Cole here in July and they got three runs off him in the first inning. Interestingly enough the RBIs in that first inning against Cole last year Marlon Bird who and John Buck who became Pirates two weeks later. Right. <laughs> they I won guess, they won their audition. I guess they made an impression. Off speed pitch swung and missed two and one. This is where you want Kirk Newenheis. Pretty big swing here. 2 0, trying to hit the ball for a double or out of the ballpark. All you need is a base hit here. Huge base hit. Newenheis, since his latest recall, four for eight with three doubles. So he's been swinging it well. And he fouls back the fastball. Two and two. Three year old Garrett Cole, first overall pick in the draft in 2011. Made his debut for the Pirates last year, and he was their ace coming down the stretch. Pitched wonderfully in the division series against the Cardinals, won game two, and then got out pitched in game five, the deciding game by Adam Wainwright. But he was terrific in both of those postseason outings, and he wants a conversation here with Chris Stewart. He and Stewart, I said, this is their fifth time working together. Storied collegiate career at UCLA. He's got some New York roots. His, uh, his dad grew up in Syracuse, and as a consequence, Cole was a huge Yankee fan growing up in California. In fact, he was in the stands in Arizona for the 2001 World Series. Really? Were it not his team. Two and two to New and Heist with two in scoring position. And Kirk wastes that fastball away. Anthony Recker would be next. 
Now, baseball players are superstitious. If the Mets have a great day today, break out the Royal Giants again. Wow, it's a tough call. <laughs> I'm not sure you want Bartolo Colon in that <laughs> uniform tomorrow. <laughs> Might be a problem. That goes to the backstop, bounds away. Duda will come in to score. And it's 2 0 New York. A very wild pitch careening off the backstop all the way out to first base. That's a cross up right there. He was waiting for a changeup or slider, and he got the express. Watch, he's waiting for it. Watch it just sail over his head. Never even made a move for it. Just a cross up between the catcher and the pitcher. Duda hesitated off the hard bounce, didn't know where it was going to go, but. Once he saw it bounding toward Gabby Sanchez at first base, he was able to walk on in. Yeah, and Campbell had to wait until Duda proceeded. So two runs are home. Campbell at third with two out. Three and two the count to Newenheis with Wrecker on deck. And Kirk pulls one into right field for a base hit. That'll play Campbell with the third run of the inning. And it's 3 0 New York. Neuenheis continues to take advantage of his opportunities five for nine since his recall and just as they did last year the Mets have hung a three spot on Cole in the first inning. Well nice swing here from Neuenheis fastball away able to rip it into right field. Two out hits good base running. Good at bats here against the ace of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Ray Sears the pitching coach going to go out for a conversation with Cole. Ronnie, what do you see with New Heights? There's something different in his swing. His, his swing is is more compact. It's quicker. Um, when I saw the matchup today, if you were taught, asking about Kirk New Heights two years ago, I'd say there's no way he could face a guy like Cole because he could not catch up to anything over 93 or 94 miles an hour. Now, routinely, he has that footstep that he does a lot quicker. Gets that he used to have a higher leg kick and very much quicker to the ball. You know, he put a lot of hard work down there in the minor leagues, and it looks like it's paying off. Worked with George Greer, the AAA pitching coach, to try and shorten up that swing and getting the dividends here at the big league level. So here's Wrecker, the seventh man up in the inning. And Anthony drives one to deep left center field, but this will be playable for McCutcheon back in that deep gap, and that retires the side. But the Mets put up three runs in the opening inning, all coming in after two are out. And they put a hurting on Cole early. Be long to Nice now. Dealer, hurry into your local Tri Honda dealer for great deals of the 2014 models. By Verizon, introducing Verizon Bias Quantum TV, redefining what TV can be. That's powerful. By Toyota, let's go places. By the New York Lottery, hey, you never know. And by Nissan, choose Nissan today for great offers on their most exciting lineup ever. Shop choosenissan.com. Pirates starting lineup brought to you by Toyota, let's go places. 
Glenn Hurdle was thinking of giving Gregory Polanco a day off against the lefty, but Sterling Marte's mm. finger still not allowing him to return, so Polanco stays in there. So does Pedro Alvarez, who's been sitting against some lefties lately. Those are the two left-handed bats in the lineup today against John Neese. You know, we gave you those numbers, 19 straight starts, three earned runs or less, but it's even been longer than that from John. When he got the diagnosis that he had a partial tear of his rotator cuff, when he came back off the DL, and that was August 11th last year, He's gone eight and six and 24 starts with a 2.81 ERA. Well, here's Polanco, the 22 year old who has only spent a couple of weeks in the big leagues. He's two for seven in this series, hitting 319 overall. He's only had 19 at bats against lefties, three for 19. So a little untested against pitchers from the port side. And he takes a strike. In fact, the big at bat he had last night against Josh Edge, and he popped up. It'll be Polanco, then Jordy Mercer and Andrew McCutcheon for the Pirates. With these three runs to the good before he takes the mound. As Polanco takes the cutter outside, a ball and a strike. John's last start, he got a big lead early in Miami. Had a 7 0 lead in that game. Gave three runs back before he exited. Went six. That's won that game 11 5, his fourth win of the year. And he finds a corner with a cutter. One ball, two strikes. John faced the Pirates a month ago at City Field. Pitched well in that game, five and two thirds, two runs, a no decision game for him. He's had a lot of those this year. One, two, got him. Good curveball by Nice to strike out Polanco, one away. Interesting at bat by Polanco. Took two fastballs or cutters on the outside part. Ended up swinging at the curveball out of the strike zone. Good pitch by John. So one out and nobody on. And now Jordy Mercer, who's hitting second for the first time this season for the Pirates. He's done it in the past. One for seven in the series at a two run single against Jacob DeGrom last night. That were the Pirates only two runs before their game winner in the 11th. And as we uh, as we figured Jacob was kicking himself about that fourth inning last night and his failure to cover first base on the smash hit off Duda's body. And what Jake said was he said I thought he caught it in the air so I stopped. But as you said last night, that's why you never stop. It'll never, it'll never happen again. I, I'm telling you, it's like uh, not backing up a base and the ball rattling around a two-run scoring. It just sometimes you need that lesson. But he did a nice job last night. Mercer takes a strike. Mercer has a home run to his credit against John Neese in three career at bats. I like the Pittsburgh Crawfords uniform. They're nice. Yeah. Nice clean look. It's a good changeup by Nice, which has become a much important, more important pitch for him recently. If you want to know what the uh, Crawfords means? Got to be the only team I know that was named after a nightclub and a bar that was in the <laughs> hill section here in Pittsburgh, the Crawford Grill. Two-two, cold -two. foul. Well, at least they knew where they were going after the game. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. There's a Geico defense. Young. Uh, no, Young's not out there. That'd be Eric Young in left field. Campbell, Tejada, Murphy, Duda. And of course, record behind the plate, the Geico defense. 15 minutes to save you 15%. We fumbled our Youngs. Little number. Tough play for Nice. Backhand flip goes awry. Mercer will head for second. Murphy with the backup throws wildly. Mercer will stay at second base as Neuheis comes in to sweep up. So two Aaron tosses Nice with the backhand flip and then Murphy just throwing blindly and Mercer winds up on second. Well this is uh, as ugly a play as you're going to get what John needs to do here. Do not use your bare hand use your glove and scoop it to first base that makes it much easier Just shovel it over there and um, you know many many times I'm asked to analyze Murph and I'm usually left wanting on what to say. Got to eat this one. I mean, he had no chance to make connection. Unfortunately, Newen Heist got a position to back it up. Otherwise, Mercer's at third. But you always have to appreciate the hustle to get over there. It's just the decision after that's not good. 
So it'll be scored a base hit for Mercer and then an error on Nice allowing him to get to second. Murphy gets off scot free. <laughs> Here's McCutcheon with a runner at second and one out. McCutcheon two for seven in the series. He's having a bang up month of June. Eight of his 12 home runs have come this month. And Nice runs one inside for ball one. The reigning National League MVP, fourth in the National League in hitting. Fifth in RBIs, fifth in doubles, second in on base percentage, fifth in slugging, first in walks. He's having another one of those years, maybe better statistically than last year. Murphy plays the roller and throws out McCutcheon two out as Mercer moves to third. So two way now, Gabby Sanchez. Sanchez, who had a key at bat last night as a pinch hitter in the ninth inning against Henry Mejia, who struck him out. Nonetheless, Sanchez has a well earned reputation as a Met killer, mostly from his days as a Florida Marlin, back when they were the Florida Marlins. That's right. Mercer at third with two out. Gabby now a part time player, hitting a 248 and takes the curveball for ball one. He said 23 career at bats against me, six hits, including a home run. Terry, the one thing I don't like about this defense, I want Campbell a little closer to the line. A lot of cutters to Sanchez. He's going to tend to pull it more. I like where Tejada is. He's over, and so is Murph. He's looped into left. On comes Eric Young. He's there, and that retires the side. So the Mets throw the ball around a little bit and survive the first inning with a 3 0 lead in Pittsburgh. Across the Allegheny River to downtown Pittsburgh, just across from PNC Park. It's the 6 3 bridge off to the left, the Roberto Clemente Bridge. Mm. It's almost like an honor every time we walk home to walk over the Clemente Bridge, isn't it? Mm -hmm. there there it is. They close it off to vehicular traffic on game days, so all the fans can walk. Back and forth across the bridge. I like the guy with the saxophone. He plays and he's playing for a little bit of change and he abuses me every time I walk by. <laughs> Screams at me. Hmm. Well, you probably beat the Pirates a few times. <laughs> John Neese batting eighth today takes a strike. He's one for 25 at the plate this year. Eric Young is batting ninth and then Curtis Granderson for the Mets in the second after putting up a three spot against Garrett Cole in the first. Talking last night about the fact that the Pirates were going to have to make a difficult decision on who to excise to make room for Cole off the disabled list, and they decided to send down last night's starter, Brandon Compton, despite the fact that he pitched awfully well. 
And he's down on strikes. That's the first strikeout for Cole. They had two great starts, right? In the first two games of the series, Worley went seven, Compton went seven. Well, Worley was out of options, so they didn't send him down. Jeff Locke was the other consideration, but right now he's the only lefty in their rotation, so they kept him around and sent out Compton, who I'm sure will be back. Everyone's got their hat on a little sideways. This Worley on the right. <laughs> well, here's Eric Young batting ninth. Eric had been playing every day after coming off the disabled list with a hamstring injury. Then Juan Lagares got back. The Mets outfield got more crowded, and EY hasn't played the last couple of days. This would be a great day for him because of what we mentioned earlier Cole's inability to hold runners on. If he can get on base, it may be a big stolen base day for him. Well, finds the inside corner and gets ahead 0 2. Well, some of it's happenstance and some of it is for real, but that's what happens when Eric Young starts and when he doesn't. Well, especially on these semi day games after a night game, uh, extra inning game, he brings a lot of energy to the ballpark. Ahead on Young, one and two. Breaking ball misses wide, two and two. Cole's last start was 25 days ago. He went five and two thirds in San Diego, won the game, and then they shut him down with what they call shoulder fatigue. Hmm. It's three and two to Young, and I'm, I'm wondering, is that a euphemism for something? Is that? Is that them just trying to limit his innings? What What do you think that's all about? Uh, limit limit his innings. I think they have some numbers now that organizations are using that they are starting to shut young pitchers down in the middle of the season so they can have them for the end of the season. Three two to EY and he yanks one foul. You know they did it last year with Michael Walker when he was in Memphis. They skipped a couple of his starts, so we'd have a couple at the end of the season. Basically, everybody's trying to avoid Strasburg syndrome, yeah. where you have to shut down your ace before you get to the postseason. That being said, Strasburg's never been the same since they shut him down. Neither of the Nationals. <laughs> Three-two, and Young pulls one foul. By the way, we have determined why the saxophone player gives you grief every time he crossed the bridge. Yeah. Lifetime 11 and 6, 2.87 against the Pirates. He does. He ears. <laughs> he ears me out. I'll feel better now when he ears me out. <laughs> there were there were times um, when the Pirates in the late 80s were trying to get good, yeah. but hadn't gotten there yet. Where you guys just dominated them. I think won 17 of 18 one year. Yeah. That's outside ball four. Cole wanted the call, didn't get it. And Eric Young is aboard, and now Cole has a problem on his hands. Well, close pitch. I think a good call by Bassner there. Stewart tries to sneak it back in there in the strike zone. You know what's interesting about the Pirates then is that they had gone to a place after 79 where they're trying to figure out do, do, you, do you have young guys, do you have old guys, and they had a lot of older players. Uh, Steve Kemp was one of their outfielders. Um, just a lot of older players until they had, of course, Bonds, Mania, Vance like in the game. Bill Ballier and yeah. Doug Drabeck and all those guys that made it them such a formidable team late 80s, early 90s. Pirate Parrot having some fun. Randerson grounded out to first base his first trip. Young is on his way. The throw by Stewart, no chance. 19 stolen bases on the year for Eric Young. You know what's amazing about that stolen base by Young is that he made sure that he didn't get too big of a, not too big of a jump, but leave early because he knew the time for Cole to deliver it leaves Stewart no time to throw him out. Well, we've seen the Mets on too many occasions take off too early. It happened to Chris Young last night. So now EY in scoring position with one out. And Granderson fouls it back. One and two. Watch, this is not a great jump. Watch. See, that is not a classic Eric Young jump jump. He usually gets maybe another step more than that. But he didn't need it. 
Despite the fact that he missed all that time with a hamstring injury and has not been an everyday player, Eric now with 19 steals is fourth in the league in stolen bases. Last year's National League stolen base champ. Mercer playing right behind him, so he can't get much of an idea about stealing third as Granderson pulls one foul. Well, last night, Granderson, we mentioned, hit a couple of the center field fence. Well, usually if you don't hit it out of the ballpark, you're going to be disappointed because their center fielder just goes up and gets him with a smile on his face. And we've not seen their outfield intact in this series, but when they have Marte, McCutcheon, and Polanco together in that outfield, not too much is going to get by. Slider misses to Granderson, two and two. Ruben Tejada waiting on deck. Mercer playing right there so that Young can't get much of a lead. Two two coming to Granderson. And Curtis watches wide and again. Cole goes to a full count. He was ahead 0 and 2 on Eric Young and lost him to a walk. Now he's gone full to Granderson as well. Granderson's second in the National League in walks with 48. Looking for his first hit though in this series. He's gone 0 for 9. Three two and he walked him second walk of the inning. So Cole who generally does not walk many clearly out of sorts in his first start back from the disabled list. Out of sorts frustrated agitated. Um, you know what's interesting about Curtis Granderson. Is that when he was brought here it was what the intention of batting behind David protecting him because he had great power. But what was forgotten well, I'm sure it wasn't forgotten. Is that he had some of his greatest years, even in the power department, batting first or second in the lineup. So I like him at the top of the lineup, not down the lineup. He's a big on base guy, so he sets the table. Well, he spent most of his tenure in Detroit as a leadoff man, and then batted behind Jeter when he was when he scored, I think, 136 or 139 runs that one year. So now two aboard for Tejada, who pulled a base hit through the hole in the left to get the Mets started in the opening inning. Tejada now three for eight in this series, batting here with two on and one out. And Ruben lays off the slider. And that's been a big part of these first two innings for the Mets. They have not offered at Cole's breaking stuff. Well, with Granderson on first and not being held on, which you wouldn't be, he's got, you know, 10, 20 foot lead, 15 foot lead. You could have a double steal here. Look like though that Eric Young is getting much of a lead at second base. Well, they've got Walker watching Young at second base, but not nearly as close as Mercer was in the previous at bat. I mean, there's Granderson. He just gets in a position to just watch Eric, and if he takes off, he's going. Look at Sanchez so far off the line, and there they go in Tejada. Swinging fouls it off. Well, it would have been an easy double steal. They both got huge jumps. You know, you can't fault the hot of there, though. It's one and one. You got a pitch to hit. You got to swing the bat. But you're right. Huge jump. Young leaves first. Granderson follows. I mean, Granderson doesn't even have to get a jump yeah. because of where Gabby Sanchez is playing. He gets so far off in his initial lead. Just get off as far as Sanchez is. That's the key. Maybe further. Gabby doesn't run that well. <laughs> One and two to Tejada. A long hold. They're running again, and Tejada goes down on strikes, and they walk in with the double steal. So it's the second out of the inning, but Young has his second stolen base of the inning, his 20th of the year, and Granderson picks up his sixth. So the Mets taking advantage of Cole's inability to hold runners. Boy, this is something that this young man's going to have to get better at at some point. I mean, when you're striking out the world, that's fine. But uh, in those days where you don't have your best stuff, like today, hard to have those guys doing laps on the bases. So two in scoring position for Murphy, who flied to center his first time up. That's already with a three nothing lead in the second. 
if he takes a slider for a strike. Fifty pitches already for Cole. With two out of the second inning. And Murphy has to move his feet. 98 from Cole, one and one. Well, that's where he sat for most of last season when he won 10 ball games. But he doesn't have that arm strength early in the game today. This year, his average fastball velocity has been 95.6, which is not bad mm -hmm. at all. Lucas Duda waiting on deck. 1 1 coming to Murphy. And he lines it over short. That's a base hit, and that'll bring in two. Young is in. Granderson right behind him. Daniel Murphy with a two run single, and it's five to nothing, New York. Well, we saw Murphy in, in last night's ball game have the same kind of hit. A little backdoor slider, not trying to do too much, just taking it over the shortstop's head. How many times have you heard Keith Hernandez talk about that swing right there? Perfectly executed by the Murph. Head down, almost like he's he's lowering himself to get down to that baseball. Well, it's helped Murph have so far had the best offensive season of his career. His 98th hit, he now has 32 runs batted in. Here's Duda with Murphy at first and two out. And uh, probably wouldn't be unexpected for Murph to try and steal one. He um, he tried with Duda at the plate in the 10th inning yesterday. That didn't go so well. But now with Cole really struggling to keep anybody close, he might try it again. Cole sails one out of the strike zone. He looks bothered. Yeah, my, my feeling here uh, with Murph is that you've got five runs on the board. Duda is hot. Cole is struggling. Stay there. Let him hit the baseball. That's with five runs and five hits in these first two innings. And uh, so far, this game is reminiscent of John Neese's last start, the one in Miami when the Mets were putting up tons of runs. And we'll get another visit from the pitching coach, Ray Searage. In that game, the Mets faced the New Jersey native, Anthony DeSclafani, and put up seven runs in the first four innings. You know, his body language is, is, is not good. So I think that's why Serge is going out there and saying, you know, you, you got to straighten them out. Hey, listen, not only are you pitching this game, and I know it's struggling because you've given up five runs, you're struggling, but he's got to get his work in too. You know, Gary, he had a 84 pitches in that simulated game. He's got to get to a point where they get him back to that 90 plus pitch level. Well, he might get there very early that's in right. this game, the way it's going. But the other thing is, um, they don't want to have to go to the bullpen in the second or third inning. We've got Edison Volquez going tomorrow. He's not a guy who pitches deep in the games. So it's a team thing as well. 2 0 to Duda, who had a base hit and scored a run in the first. And that's wide for ball three. Eric Campbell, who drove in the first med run, is waiting on deck. 26 pitches in the first inning, 29 already in the second inning for Garrett Cole. Due to take strike three and one. And Lucas pulls one into the shift. Walker with a nice backhand stop and throws him out to end the inning. But the men's get a couple of walks, steal three bases. And Daniel Murphy cashes him in with a Murphy hit right over the shortstop's head to drive in two. And the Mets five runs to the good in the second inning.
Atlantic City do anything do everything do AC. The view behind the right field stands right along the Allegheny River. Got that footpath there got the boats stopped. Jared Cole might be wanting to jump on one of those boats. Right about now. I've had starts where I've wanted to jump off a boat. Josh Harrison last night's hero for the Pirates hero in so many ways. Leading off against John Neese in the second. Well he had the game winning hit against Vic Black in the 11th inning the double to right center that brought in the winning run. But all anybody wanted to talk about with Harrison last night was his. Broken field run. Between second and third. That was in the 10th inning. Well, Henry Mejia does a nice job. Run at him, give the ball to the athletes, and then let him take charge. But Clint Hurdle said he was expecting at some point Max Patton to come out, where you point to the sky, and hopefully they don't throw the ball. Now, now what fascinates me, talking to Terry Collins today, apparently the umpires told him that the reason Harrison was not called for running out of the baseline when he came out of the infield grass is because nobody attempted to tag him. Well, look at this. Sehat is trying to tag him, and he goes out of the infield grass well out of the baseline to get out of the way as he strikes out here. So that makes absolutely no sense. And Scott Barry, the second base up, is looking right at it. I mean, what, what, what else do you do? Listen, whatever they were trying to cover up, it didn't work. It, 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 it was water game. Uh, I mean, there was just an obvious, obvious, obvious call that was missed. Happens. And, uh, um, what a great job by Mejia. Right. Well, he did a great job. Second and third, and nobody out after that non call. And he got two strikeouts and a fly ball. None bigger than the one he got on Neil Walker for the first out. I mean, he was the biggest threat coming up after that play, and right. Mejia got him. Remember, folks, like, let's say a double is hit and you round first, you can end up, like, almost uh, at second base as you're making the turn. So there are times that you're going to be out of kind of the baseline. Which I would equate to the, the straight line between first and second, second and third, whatever. But you can't go out of the baseline to avoid a tag more than three feet, and that's that's the key language. And that was the contention of the umpires that he left the baseline, but it wasn't to avoid a tag because he said nobody tried to tag him. But clearly that wasn't true, as we just showed on the replay. That Tejada did try to tag him, which is why he went out of the baseline. So it was just a it was just a bad call. Yeah, they asked uh, uh, Josh Harrison where did he get that from his football days. He said no. When I was a kid and they had the fire drills, it was stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> <Is> that? <laughs> I thought that was great. There's Pedro Alvarez with two out. Alvarez has not been starting every game against left-handers this year. He's in just 216 against southpaws, but he's had a great series. He's four for five. He's been on base his last six plate appearances, and so Clint Hurdle rolling with the New York. Product and he fouls one at the plate and it's 0 2. In fact, he's 8 for 14 now against the Mets this year. That one caught Wrecker, I think, on the right hand. Could be wrong, but uh, he'll walk it off here. See his right hand near his foot? Oh boy, hit him right on his thumb. Folks, I can't even express to you how much that hurts. Now catchers are taught to make sure that hand is out of play behind their back behind their leg. Yes. Was that a bad spot that he shouldn't have had his hand in. That's a bad spot. He should he should have that like just behind his leg near his like Achilles or calf. I bet you he does it this time. And he still leaves it hanging just a little bit out there. I mean listen. It's tools of the trade. Uh, these catchers just have their way of doing it where they're most comfortable, and sometimes it leaves them open to a foul tip. But you can't get it more than this right on the thumb. These ahead, one and two. And Alvarez lines it on one hopper, snagged by Tejada, throwing from his knee, and he got him. Boy, Tejada's just doing everything right these days. That was an awkward play for Ruben. Expected to catch it on a line, got the short hop, and didn't even bother getting up. And from one knee, he was able to throw out Alvarez. Beautifully done.
Good start. Leading the Pirates five to nothing. It'll be Eric Campbell, Kirk Neuenheis, and Anthony Recker. Five, six, and seven of the Mets batting order in the third. John Neese and Ruben Tejada talking about that last play. It's like that away. Nice play, Ruben. Something has happened with Ruben Tejada. And maybe it was just the presence of Flores as as direct competition, but the light bulb went on about a month ago, and he is playing at an entirely different level. Playing with confidence, isn't he? It's fun to watch. And he's fielding his position as well as he ever has. He's getting on base the way he did a couple of years ago. And the troubles from last year and the early part of this year appear to be forgotten. He, we went a long time without seeing him have a smile on his face. Now it's there a lot. And you see the difference over this last month or so offensively. Even his slugging percentage is over 400 the last month, which you don't expect to see. Campbell goes down on strikes. Third strike after Garrett Cole was just trying to have something positive happen for him. Well, he pounded Campbell in here with that fastball. He's got great run to his fastball, not sink, great run to his fastball. More movement than you'll see from a guy who throws this hard. What the scouts call arm side run. Yes, there you go. Here's New and Heiss who singled in a run with two out of the first. And he skies one to center, pretty well hit. Back goes McCutcheon onto the warning track and has enough room to reel it in. Well, New and Heiss just quality at bat after quality at bat. Came up a little short that time for the second out. Well, this ballpark, uh, the one place it gives left handed hitters a break is on the pull side, but anytime you hitting the ball to center or left center, it's an awfully big stadium. And it costs new and nice hair. There's no wind at all today. The flags are hanging limp. So no boost. Even on a, a humid afternoon with the ball tends to travel pretty well. So two out and nobody on. Now Wrecker who got whacked in the thumb by that foul ball in the last half inning will have to try and grip it. Wrecker fly to center his first time up. And he takes a fastball for a strike. One Wrecker is pretty tough. And secondly, I don't think you really appreciate how big he is, but you get a better feel for it in this Royal Royal Giants uniform. Kind of like a refrigerator with a batting helmet on. I mean, he's huge. Out to left field. Harrison back a few strides, battling the sun, and he lost it. Wrecker was not running hard. Now we'll have to try and get to second. Harrison's throw comes in too late. It's a double for Wrecker on a ball that Josh Harrison lost in the sun. <laughs> he said to McCutcheon, I never saw it. Well, that's pretty obvious. But you see, Wrecker, just a sky ball to left field. He was disappointed that he didn't catch that one. He thought it was a pitch he should have hit out of the ballpark. And Harrison was lost the entire time. Never saw it. Tried to get in a position that maybe it will come out of the sun and never did. And you never want to be caught doing this ever, ever, ever. This looks bad for your team and it looks bad for you. Well, fortunately for Wrecker, he was able to beat the play at second base. Otherwise, it would have looked even worse. So it goes as Wrecker's seventh double of the year. We were talking the first two games of this series, which began in the twilight, about left field and center field being difficult. But here we are a little earlier in the day, and left field came into play. So now Nice in the number eight hole, bats with a runner at second and two out. John struck out his first time up. Kind of a uh, iffy thing because of the record hit. I mean, it should have been an out, but. Just when it looked like Garrett Cole might have had himself a one, two, three inning. Mets didn't have an extra base hit in 11 innings last night. They've got their second double in this game. And these watches wide, two and one. Don't think about John, he doesn't go out of the strike zone. He's already drawn four walks this year. He does. He has a good sense of the strike zone for a hitting pitcher. Strike two and two.
Rick Young, the number nine hitter, hoping for a turn. Wrecker at second with two out. And Nice is down on strikes to end the inning. Fourth strikeout with Garrett Cole. It works around that sun aided double. We go to the bottom of the third in Pittsburgh, 5 0 New York. Covering up, I said to Gary in between innings, I said he avoided the tag last night and he avoided the baseball today. But the, there's nothing really you can do on that situation. He did everything he could, tried to turn sideways, tried to get his glove up. Well, you wonder also, I mean, Harrison is a guy who is a jack of all yeah. trades, more of an infielder than an outfielder, and you wonder whether lack of experience plays a role as well. Well, when I look at Harrison as a player, I say to myself, you want to get him in the lineup? Not for his defense, for his offense. He's a good offensive player. So John Neese back to the mound for the bottom of the third, working with a five run lead. Tony so Lake getting out there after making the final out. Tony Phillips was like that. You know, he could play all the positions, and I, he was very adequate at all the positions. Right. But his key is he could lead off for your team, and he was a great offensive player. Chris Stewart, the former Yankee. Is the backup catcher these days for the Pirates, backing up Russell Martin, who started the first two games of the series. Stewart's now 32 years old with his sixth major league team and takes ball one from Nice. Stewart in the lineup today because he is 8 for 17 against left hand pitching this year, which is not the norm for him. Off his foot. A couple of double headers going on today in the National League. Hot days for double headers. The Braves and Phillies are in the ninth. Braves are up nine to three in the first of a double header. And the Nats behind Gio Gonzalez beat the Cubs three nothing in the first of their double header. Any McCarthy catches today or <laughs> none that I'm aware of. A looper for Murphy to play and Stewart retired one out. You can follow every Mets game with MLB.com at bat on your favorite mobile phone or tablet. Get live look ins, instant replays, scores, stats, audio, free MLB.tv game of the day, and more. Download on the App Store or visit Mets.com today. Now, Garrett Cole is a pretty good hitting pitcher. Five hits this year, 12 for his career, a lifetime 214 hitter. That puts you in the upper echelon. Here's a strike. Now you gave a good accounting of yourself at, a, at the plate as a pitcher. 
when you looked at your batting average yeah. what did you consider to be a line of demarcation for what you considered a good pitcher's batting average? Uh, 175 I think is the number 175 180 anything above that um, is a is a pretty good hitting pitcher now that sounds kind of silly right line to the right center and Cole's got himself another hit so he shows off his bona fides and the second hit for the Pirates but really what it comes down to Gary do you get the bunts down as Cole hits this one to right quick bat powerful swing um, do you make the pitcher work a little bit um, what happens is if you can hit it all I mean there's there's guys that are real legit hitters Rick Roden in my day Don Robbins etc. And then there's guys like me that were decent athletes that kind of figure it out. But if you're in that group what they just do is they just spin the ball and there's a reason you're a pitcher because you couldn't hit it when they sp spun it in college. So that's what they do and it just kind of takes you out of the mix. Well that's what Jacob DeRom starting to find yes. out right gets a few hits and all of a sudden they're pitching him like a hitter okay. instead of like a pitcher. Here's Gregory Polanco struck out leading off the first inning and takes a slider out of the strike zone. I think I looked up that last year the major league batting average for pitchers was like 126 mm. something like that the the composite average. So you know anything over 160 you'd have to yeah. consider to be um, fairly respectable. Now. You also get things like John Neese who hit over 200 last year and can't get out of his own way this year. So sometimes that happens too. You have those years sometimes where everything finds a hole and then other years you just strike out seems every at bat. Slowly hit to Duda who takes the out at first. polanco has got those long strides going down the line even when he was pulling up. He made it a close play. That's the second out as Cole goes to second. John this year has 18 strikeouts. It's just something you don't see from him. He's a guy who makes contact. But again, they know he can hit a little bit, pitching him a little tough. So two out, Cole at second, and now Jordy Mercer, who had that little number that went for an infield hit that Nice then threw away for an error in the first inning. Mercer got as far as third, but was stranded there. And the curveball in for a strike. John has not thrown a lot of curveballs early in this game. It's funny about him and his pitch, pitch selection, isn't it? It's like if he doesn't have a feel for it, he lets it go for a while. But sometimes it's a score, too. He's got five runs, so maybe a little more aggressive, less curves. Popped up. Tejada shading his eyes. And stays with it to retire the side. A base hit and one left. We played three in Pittsburgh on a warm afternoon. Mets five, Pirates nothing.
field, the site of which is now on the University of Pittsburgh campus, but they've retained part of the outfield fence. And uh, that's a shot of some of the fans rooting during the 1960 World Series. That is the path of the left field wall over which Bill Mazeroski hit his wow. series winning home run in 1960. Pirates moved during the season in 1970. Which today. was uh, 44 years ago today. They moved to Three Rivers Stadium, which uh, they played at until, well, through the 2000 season. Moved here to PNC Park in 2001. In fact, the Mets played the first ever game here at PNC Park. It was an exhibition game right before the 2001 season. Well, I was thinking to myself when we read that first sign, the first all steel and concrete facility, and I'm thinking to myself, why would it be here? Duh. It's Pittsburgh. Yeah, there, there was a little bit of steel lying <laughs> around right. that they could use to build a ballpark. I mean, come on. <laughs> All right. Eric Young will lead off of the Mets in the fourth inning. Eric Walk stole second, stole third, and scored on a base hit by Daniel Murphy in the second. We figured this might be a good day for EY with Cole, who has troubles holding on runners, and it's worked out that way so far for Eric. A rough go of it for Cole in his first start back from the disabled list. Five runs and six hits, 69 pitches over the first three innings. And Eric takes the curveball up and away for ball one. It'll be Young, then Granderson, and Tejada for the Mets in the fourth. That's got three in the first and two in the second off Cole. Pirates pinch their corner infielders in against the speed of Young. And Cole, who desperately wants not to walk him, falls behind him 2 0. Anderson on deck. You've had this day that you never wanted to have if you're Garrett Cole, right? You were all amped up to come back from the DL and you've, you've had a, a rough first three innings. Round it toward the hole, and Eric Young is aboard again. So EY after a walk his first time up as a base hit in his second at bat and now he'll poise himself to try and swipe a few more bags. New York Mets baseball is brought to you by infinity luxury cars that deliver inspired performance. So if you're Cole how do you salvage your day here. I, well I, I think he was trying to do it on the first two pitches to Eric Young two curveballs in a row two breaking balls in a row. I'm sure that he's sitting on the bench going wait a minute. Okay. Now I'm throwing fastballs. I'm not finding my spots. My changeup's not great, but I've got to at least work on my breaking balls. So the next time I go out, I have one. There's another one. So a guy who throws 95 to 100 miles an hour is going to try to spend the next two innings, three innings, just working on being a pitcher, getting a feel for his breaking ball, getting a feel for his changeup. Young is running. Stewart is throwing. And no chance. I mean, Cole's just not giving Stewart any chance at all to throw anybody out. That's the Mets' fourth stolen base of the game, the third for Eric Young. Well, the last time I saw a track meet like this was when Dwight Gooden pitched in the day, but it didn't really matter because, uh, you know, two or three guys would get on per game, so it wasn't a big deal. But that's just part of the game that he's going to have to work on. Well, three stolen bases in the game, one shy of a Mets club record. Young now with 21 for the year. The last Met to steal four in a game, surprisingly enough, was David Wright. Oh. Jose Reyes never had four in a game as a Met. Vince Coleman did it twice. Roger Sedano did it. David Wright did it, but never Reyes. Never Mookie popped up into shallow right, and Neil Walker called off by Polanco, and that's the first out. Play of the game brought to you by the 2014 Mazda 3 with seamless connectivity. Take it away, Ruben Tejada. That was a bullet, wasn't it? And just calmly pretended that it was Three Rivers Stadium again. Made the AstroTurf kind of one bounce to do that. Now, here's my question. It's the fourth inning. How do we know that's the play of the game? Well, I, yeah, I think a little uh, premature play of the game, personally. Apparently we have a, a panel which is responsible for the voting and they have decided that that play cannot be outdone. Or maybe we'll have another play of the game later. 
sure the sponsor would be very happy to have another mansion. No, they, they make a decision and they're gone. That's okay. it. Yes. They're, they're off for the rest of the day. Yep. They're sitting by the pool. It might be one of the reasons they came up with the early <laughs> play of the game. Well, EY's already stolen third base once today. We'll see if he tries to do it again with Tejada at the plate. Ruben singled and scored in the first, struck out in the second, as Young and Granderson were executing a double steal. And Cole runs one inside. 1 0. Oh. The club record for most steals in a game is seven. And that came in the same game where Wright stole four. It was in San Francisco in 2009. The other three Carlos Beltran, Gary Sheffield, and Alex Cora. Oh, really? Who was not known for his speed. <laughs> Might have been the back end of a double steal, I'm right. not sure. <laughs> I wonder who the pitcher that day. Of. Had to be like Lincecum, right? Yeah. He doesn't we'll hold runners well. I have to go back and look at that. Two and out to Tejada as Young dances off second, getting Cole's attention, and time is finally asked for. All of this is uh, fantastic stuff because unless you have your wits about you, it just upsets all your timing as a pitcher. 2 0 on Tejada, his fifth 2 0 count here in the fourth inning. Tough way to live. And now 3 0. Cole, who uh, generally does not walk many, walked back to back hitters in the second inning, and they both came around to score. Now behind 3 0 on Tejada with Murphy and Duda to follow. No action in the Pirates' bullpen. They're going to ride Cole out as far as his pitch count will allow. He's about to throw his 80th. There's a strike. I would suspect they said he threw 84 in a simulated game. I would suspect this is going to be his last inning. Yeah, because a lot of these pitchers have been under duress also. Guys on base, guys stealing. Hey, Sears has turned himself into one of the better pitching coaches in the National League. He had a. Uh, his ball four into Hadazan, third walk given up by Cole. He had a magical year last year, didn't he, Searidge? Yeah. Everything that the Pirates touched and sent to the mound went right. A lot of lefty pitching coaches in the game, right? When you think about it, Dave Rigetti, Ray Searidge, Dan Worthen. Um, um, but Black was. Uh, uh, Buddy Black. Um, pitch, he pitched for the Mets. Keith's friend from Northern California. Uh, Bob McClure. Bob McClure. Well, Frank Viola now. Frankie V. Working in AAA for the Mets. Who knew the lefties were paying that much attention? I never <laughs> knew they were. I they thought they just wore their hats funny and kind of went out there every fifth day. They were paying attention. They were just doing it in a different modality, <laughs> different protocol. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's Murphy, who drove in a pair with a base hit into left center his last time up. Young at third, to, uh, Young at second, to Hot at first, and this time Cole will try and slow Eric down. Braves have won the opening game of that doubleheader in Philly 10 to 3. Irvin Santana, who's been struggling, got a passel of runs to work mm. with today. No home runs in that game, so no chances for Tom McCarthy. Might have caught a foul ball, you never know. But I think they were probably back in the booth today after their foray. I said to Tom, I, I texted him last night. I said, oh, you, you, did. you know, you're never going to get more attention <laughs> <laughs> than, than you're going to get over this. I've seen it on every highlight show at least five times this morning. Well, you know you've uh, you've made it when you're watching uh, ESPN and they'll have on the side marker what they're going to be talking about coming up, and this is the play by Tommy Mack. Caught it right before it hit the camera or something out there in center field. His comment to me was, "It's a good thing I didn't drop it." Yeah, right. Because <laughs> that would have been on every highlight show too. Murphy pops one up in foul ground. That's going to be beyond anybody's reach. One and two. Freeman ended up driving in all four runs in last night's game. So we questioned why he was in a slump. He must have hurt us. Mm -hmm. Well, in today's game, Justin Upton and Tommy Lastella each drove in three. Have you seen much of Lastella? I have. He's a little gamer. You're going to like watching him play. 
I mean, he's got the right name for it, right? The star. The star. <laughs> well, the Mets will be in Atlanta starting Monday night for three games. I think it'll be a little warm. Cole ahead on Murphy one and two and Daniel asked for time. Pirates get the bullpen cranking now. Right hander Jean Marc Gomez is up and getting ready. He's their long man from the right side. Made a start or two against the Mets. It's amazing how speed on the bases. Slows the game down. I remember the first time I ever heard that was the great Tim McCarver. Mm -hmm. The more speed you have on the bases, the slower the game goes because you got to hold them close. And young again dancing off the bag and getting Cole's attention. And that slows it down even more, much to the dissatisfaction of Murph. You know, who it, just wants his turn at bat. You know what's interesting is that Cole is looking at Young like he's not appreciating what Young is doing. One, the lead is not big enough. Two, um, hold runners on better. It's only the fourth inning. Exactly. We've already seen Cole. He got fired on Carlos Gomez one game, almost incited a riot. Mm. So, you know, his temperature runs hot anyway, and I'm sure it's even hotter today. Well, he can't be happy with his own performance, and that tends to put you in a foul mood. Another pickoff try, and Young is back. Well, team's wearing their Negro League tribute uniforms today. You know, Cole may say after the game, I want to be a Crawford. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, what's your Dibble story? Didn't Dibble have to wear a, uh, a uniform he didn't like one time? Gave up a walk off homer to Bobby Bonilla and ripped it off as he was coming off the field. <laughs> yeah, I remember that very well. Well, it, it's such a great tribute, and I like when the teams do it. Now, I know the uniforms look a little funky uh, uh, at, uh, on occasion, but you know what's great about it? You're sitting in the stands with your kid. And you do a little homework, you can let them know what used to be some of the great players that were. It's all for the good. Yeah, right? You know, the uh, Josh Gibson Foundation here in Pittsburgh does a tremendous amount for education and such. Murphy drives one down the right field line toward the pole and a foul ball. Just missed a three run homer. Fastball in Murph awfully quick and just a little too quick. He's trying to keep it fair. That's his Carlton Fisk, I guess, version of it. And he knew it had just hooked a little bit and gone foul. Eighth pitch of the at bat coming to Murphy. And Daniel watches low inside. Two and two. Cole still throwing hard. 97 miles an hour on that last pitch. is 88th of the game. You know, he'll learn as time goes on to read the bat. You know, we always talk about Greg Maddox did that better than anyone. If you throw a fastball into a hitter like Murphy, let's let the pitch come in here. And he turns on it and hits a foul. Your best fastball in. That means that his bat is awfully quick. How do you counter that? You counter that with a good change up a breaking ball. So that's how things that young pitchers have to learn as they go along. And, and he went he went with another fastball. Yeah, he's got a veteran catcher behind the plate and Chris Stewart. Isn't he part of the equation too? Yes. But he, if Stewart might have put it down, he might have shook him off. This will be the tenth pitch of the at bat when Cole gets around to it. I just think that the game has just no rhythm for Cole. He doesn't feel any rhythm out there. None of his pitches he can command or control. It's one of those starts that happens occasionally where you sit back on it after the game's done or the next day or the day you throw on the side and you go, what a waste. I mean, like you feel like you just wasted a start. Young at second to hot at first. 2 2 to Murphy, and the changeup sits high, full count. Well, Murphy's had himself a 
an extended stay. Hmm. You get a lot of uh, a lot of bonus points. This will be the eleventh pitch of the at bat. The runners go. Murphy pulls it off the glove of Sanchez, recovered by Walker, and Cole covers, and they get the out. Three, four, one on the putout, and the runners move to second and third. Well, this was a nice play by both Walker and then Cole. One misplay by Sanchez, but Walker's there with the hustle, and good job by Cole. We talked about it last night with Jacob DeGrom as they were going on the pitch. This is why you always run over to cover, because you just never know what's going to happen, and it worked out for Cole. I thought that Eric Young Jr. for a while there was going to think about rounding third. I think he was pulling up when he got to third, yeah. and that's why he would have uh, he didn't because he would have had to reignite. <laughs> so here's Duda and they're pitching to him with first base open. As soon as it's pulled you just hustle over there and he did. Good play. Duda's one for two today and he skies one to center easy for McCutcheon. And that retires the side. So Cole able to work out of trouble in the top of the fourth. Five nothing New York. July 4th with a post game fireworks show presented by City following the Mets game against the Rangers at 710. For tickets, visit Mets.com slash fireworks. Who's Hot is brought to you by your local Ford dealer for great deals on select vehicles. Visit TristateFord.com. And yes, the defending National League MVP is hot. Wow, look at those numbers. Well, you know, he's that kind of player. He is a uh, he's a fun player to watch. You don't want to miss any of his at bats. Pirates have gone 16 and 9 in June, in part because of McCutcheon's exploits. John Neese runs a cutter inside, and it's ball one. McCutcheon grounded out to second base his first time up. John Neese has spent long stretches of time in the dugout today, even that last half inning where the Mets did not score. Between Eric Young being on base and Murphy's 11 pitch at bat, it seemed like that half inning went on forever. Never complained, though. Five runs. Beautiful. Seven runs his last start. But you know you talked about Cole never getting into a rhythm today. What about if you're the party of the other part and you have those long stretches sitting in the dugout. But Jonathan needs three four years ago I'd worry. I don't worry about him now. I just think uh, he's gotten to a certain point in his career where. He, he's been through everything you can be through. Uh, go through 30 degree weather rain delayed on a rain delay this kind of game. So once you've been through it all you know what not to do and what to do. Right center field. That's a base hit from McCutcheon. It finds the gap. 
Cut off by Granderson and McCutcheon easily into second with a leadoff double. Looks like he almost stumbled coming into second base, thus the big smile on his face. Well, he has one of the quickest bats in the league, and the one thing he can do is go coast to coast. He can take you out the left field, but also drop one in in right center. And when he's running the bases, oh, he stumbled a little bit before he got to second. Like you said, Gary, a little stutter step. He's got about as beautiful a track kind of run that you'll see. 24 doubles now for McCutcheon, one of the top figures in the league. Just the third hit for the Pirates, and now Gabby Sanchez, who flied out to left his first time up. First time today, the Pirates have had the leadoff man on. And Sanchez fouls it off, and we check in with Kevin Burkhardt. Kevin? Oh, you guys are talking about pitchers being in a rhythm. Certainly, Jacob DeGrom had that last night. I mean, really, just one play where he didn't cover first base, and maybe he throws a shutout last night. But, Gary, you pointed it out early in the broadcast. His velocity was up a tick, and even late in the game, I saw 95, maybe even 96 from him. It's a little bit higher than it normally is. Check this out why it got better. One day after his start, he was back in his place, getting ready to go to the ballpark, and he's flipping through the channels, and he catches one of our rebroadcasts. So he watches a little bit and there's a slow mo of his delivery and he says wow I'm really flying open with my landing leg there. I got to go check this out. So he went into the video room when he got in and he noticed his landing leg was kind of landing a little bit towards the first base side and he thought his shoulder was flying open as a result. So he sat with Dan Worth and they talked about it and all that chain reaction had him not getting completely on top of the ball. They started working on it in the bullpen before Miami Sanchez going to go take a seat and he's with the strikeout. And um, then they continued working on it for the bullpen for this game. The result, probably an extra two miles an hour on his fastball. So how about that? You know, Kevin, when you interviewed Jacob DeGrom during the game, he was saying that he was working on fastball command and repeating his delivery. Yeah. Once you start repeating your delivery, that's when you consistently throw harder for longer periods of time as opposed to just splashes of 95. Now you start to have it uh, in bigger bunches. Here's Josh Harrison with one out. He fouls off the curveball. Now, if you're, if you are striding a little bit off center, how difficult is that to correct? Oh, I don't think it's that hard to correct. So, because what you do is that you draw a line from where your foot is down to where you want to land, and you work on that on the side where it becomes comfortable. It's very similar to hitters trying to make sure that they stride at the pitcher and not open or closed. At this level, you can usually make the adjustment over two or three sessions in the bullpen. And you know he also talked about uh, the same type of uh, things. He said, you know, for me, it's always been too. When I'm when my delivery is smooth, I throw harder. I, I probably tried to amp it up just a little bit to try to get that first win. So all those things combining as factors. Steady diet curveballs for Harrison, and it's so it's You know, and then when we watch a guy like Jonathan Neese, I was trying to explain that, you know, he's such a veteran. And the way he goes about his business, that's why he has the 19 straight starts, three earned runs or less. But he's also doing something that that the younger pitchers are going to learn, and that is, is that he's got a beautiful uh, rhythm to the way he throws. He's got a beautiful way of uh, releasing the ball without having maximum effort. Murphy to his right, tough play, bobbles it, and has no play. And Harrison has himself an infield hit. Probably was not going to get Harrison even had he handled that cleanly. With the speed Josh Harrison has. Well, what made this play tough? You see Murphy up in the right hand corner is that he was holding McCutcheon on 5 0. I don't know why. And then, secondly, watch where he's going. He's going to his left when the ball is going to his right. You have to be stationary and in a ready position when the ball is hit. That's how you'll have your maximum coverage of an area. Well, we've seen that with Murph before. He tries to read the signs, which a middle infielder likes to do, to get an idea where the ball might be struck. But sometimes he gets himself moving when he shouldn't be. If you have all your momentum moving left, it's, it just makes sense that you're not going to get over to the right as quickly. So now first and third and one out. Neil Walker, the batter, and he fires the cutter inside. Walker grounded out to third base his first time up. So John finding his first real trouble of the afternoon. Worked around a runner in scoring position in the first as well as the third, but now first and third and one out. And that misses inside the walker, two and out. And I guess the other part about Nice, uh, and you mentioned it, Gary, you know, he's not throwing as hard as he was before. And when most, most pitchers, 
That is a warning sign. But for Jonathan, it's not. I think he's developed a, you know, 95% of maximum uh, where he knows where the ball is going to go at all times. And when he needs to go to 100%, he uses it three or four times a game. Some tight pitches, not getting the calls from Toby Basner. Now it's 3 0. Good pitch. Hard to see from this angle, so I'm not going to criticize Basner. But Jonathan Neese certainly thought it was a strike. Well, the Mets have not been as unhappy with Basner as the first time they saw him behind the plate this year. And that's ball four. The bases are loaded. So Neese, who had not walked the batter all day, walks Walker on four pitches. And then Walker's going to take a trip to the mound. When Nice goes after Pedro Alvarez, who has the ability to make this a very close game in a hurry. You know, Gary, I, I discounted what you said in trying to kind of analyze what he's going through, John Nice. But I think you might have a little more than I thought you did as far as long periods of time in between innings, uh, because Jonathan's just not sharp to center. And it's not even the hit to McCutcheon. That was a strike. It's just. He just doesn't walk people. And in stretches this year, he's gone through these periods where walks have hurt him. The top of the fourth inning, even though the Mets didn't score, it took 16 minutes, which is an unusually long amount of time. Now, Nice, with a 5 0 lead, has a couple of big outs to get. McCutcheon at third, Harrison at second, Walker at first, and Alvarez the batter. There's a the fastball outside. Like he stumbled a little bit coming off the mound on that pitch. Alvarez hit one to shortstop, and Tejada made a terrific play to throw him out from a knee. That was the play of the game, did you know? <laughs> we could use another play of the game right here and, and a double play. The eye strike to Alvarez gets it even one and one. Two career grand slams for Pedro Alvarez. Chris Stewart, the number eight hitter on deck. This is the big batter for Nice to try to get out. And the curveball, nowhere close, two and one. Just Seems to have lost his rhythm. Part of it is Pittsburgh by loading these bases because your mind starts to work and boy, I have a five run lead, but they do have their home run hitter up. Not generally as potent against left handed pitching, but still very dangerous. Mm. And East just can't get it where he wants to at all. Fastballs, curveballs, nothing's close right now. And now he's behind Alvarez three and one with the bases full. Jinx the inning for John talking about how good his rhythm has been over these first 15 starts of 2014 out of whack right now. And he's got a big pitch to make right now. Three one coming to Alvarez and he walked him to force it a run. Back to back walks issued by John Neese. And now it's a five to one medley. I'm going to get someone up because you've worked so hard to get this big lead. You don't want to see it go to waste. And Worth has already made a trip to the mound. Normally in these circumstances, David Wright would be coming into the mound to try and settle these down, but he's not here. So it's all on John's shoulders to try and figure out a way here. Chris Stewart, the batter, tying run at the plate in the five to one game. Stewart popped up to the second baseman his first time and takes the fastball high. And now Wrecker's going to go out to the mound to see if he can be of any service. The one thing about John that I, that I see, and we've talked about this year, he's had some leads that he's given up late in games, is that he loves to work quickly. 
but sometimes in these circumstances, we see Cologne do this all the time. Sometimes you got to slow it down and be more deliberate and think about what you're throwing. He tries to speed up the process, and that's why sometimes you see this lack of control. Gonzalez Herman up in the bullpen. Starling Marte out on deck to be a pinch hitter. 1 0 to Stewart, and that misses. And all of a sudden, the strike zone is shrinking on John Neese. This is where you'll hear phrases like, you know, don't squeeze the baseball because if you're a pitcher, you know what you're doing. You know you've lost the rhythm, you've lost the strike zone. You start to squeeze that baseball and aim it instead of let it go. McCutcheon let off the inning with a double. That's the only hard hit ball in the inning. But a run is in and the bases are loaded. Nice behind 2 0. And Stewart takes a strike on the outside corner. John threw 36 pitches to get through the first three innings, already 22 pitches. In this inning, and as many balls as strikes. Mm. Two and one to Chris Stewart, and it's ball three. You got a lifetime 217 hitter at the plate, doesn't have a home run this year. If you're ever going to just challenge a guy, this would be the time. Just throw one down the middle and hope that your fielders make a play. 3 1 coming. And he walked in another run. Three consecutive walks issued by John Neese. Two of them have forced in runs. It's now a 5 to 2 medley. I don't think it gets any more frustrating for a manager to watch this happen. The team's gotten off to such a quick start and then the f just free passes to guys that you have to challenge. Well, once again, Wrecker out, Tejada out. Trying to figure out a way to nurse John East through this inning. Strong Marte will take his first at bat in this series. He appeared as a pinch runner in the game last night. That's been his only contribution to the Pirates after banging his head and his thumb on a play at second base last weekend. So Marte, the regular left fielder, that's here with the tying runs on base. Two runs home. It's five to two New York. Three straight walks by Nice. Two runs in. Almost have to if you're a Pittsburgh Pirate. You have to take a strike, don't you? Make him throw one in there. Marte 0 for 4 as a pinch hitter this year. And the curveball misses. Ball one. So Garrett Cole is out of the game with Marte pinch hitting for him. And if Nice can't figure it out quickly, he won't be far behind. 13 of his last 15 pitches have been balls. Marte fouls one back. I don't think that was a strike either. Gregory Polanco on deck. What an odd ball inning for John Neese. Base is loaded, one out. And Marte takes a fastball for a strike. That's as authoritative a pitch as Neese has thrown in this inning. Cutter in, perfect pitch. Now John, for the first time in a while, is ahead on the count. Oh, the inside corner got him looking at the cutter. A huge second out for John Neese. Well, the Pirates won't be happy when they see this on tape. You can see a hurdle. Putin at him. This is a pitch that Bowser called for strikes when the Mets were in Anaheim against the Mets. And it's a pitch that's down in the strike zone. It doesn't look good to the opposition. Looks good to the Mets, though. Wasn't even particularly well framed by Wrecker, and he still got the call. So now two out. The eighth man up in the inning is Gregory Polanco, who struck out and grounded out. Base is loaded, two down, tying runs on base. And Polanco takes the curveball in the dirt, blocked by Wrecker. Keeps Walker at third. If you 
remember when Toby Basner had the plate against the Mets in Anaheim, he ejected David Wright and Daniel Murphy, and we caught right on camera saying, You are the worst ever. <laughs> This will be the 30th pitch of the inning for John Neese. And Polanco takes a strike, one and one. Fifteen and fifteen, not the kind of balance you want. To the Polanco, another unhappy customer at the plate. This is a better pitch, though, than the one to Marte. Polanco is such a long, lean, tall athlete. Probably thought that was down. Now, Nice with an avenue toward getting out of this inning. And the curveball dribbled foul. Boy, long time in between pitches for Nice and Record. One, two. Got him with a curveball. Record only needs to step on home plate, and that ends the inning. Three strikeouts in the inning for Nice, but three walks as well, and two runs forced across the plate. Malaco strikes out to end it. It's 5 2 New York after four. Runs. Dan doesn't want to hear it. I mean, that's a lot of. When you have an inning like that, it's really hard as a pitcher to really talk about anything. Or, I mean, usually you just sit down and hope everyone leaves you alone. You don't want to have that inning continue. Now the Pirates go to their bullpen as we go to the fifth inning. 24-year-old Stolme Pimentel. Will be the new pitcher. Was signed by the Red Sox when he was a 16 year old. Came over with Mark Melanson in the trade for Hanrahan. He's pitched this year where he's gone four and a third. So he's he's kind of a long guy out of that bullpen. Yeah, eight innings, seven, eight, eight outings, 17 innings. So he's averaged over two innings per appearance this year. 
Garrett Cole went four innings in his return from the disabled list. Five runs, seven hits, three walks, three strikeouts, a wild pitch. Worked out of trouble in the fourth inning when the Mets had a couple of men on. And kept his team at least within reasonable distance. Now they've cut it to five to two as Eric Campbell leads off against Pimentel in the fifth. Campbell drove in the first Met run with a double down the left field line in the opening inning. It'll be Campbell, New and Heisen, Wrecker in the fifth. And Pimentel gets the slider in for a strike. Shadow is just beginning to creep up on home plate. So in another half inning or so, they'll be begin to become a factor. Toward the hole and past Mercer, a base hit for Campbell, his second hit of the day. So the Mets get the leadoff man on in the fifth. The Mets' upcoming schedule brought to you by your Tri Honda dealer. Hurry in for great deals. On the 2014 models. One more game to go in this series tomorrow afternoon with Bartolo Colon on the mound. Then it's off to Atlanta for three night games Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then back home to begin the final homestand before the All Star break. Ten games starting with a trio against the struggling Texas Rangers. The other player to note in that Mark Melanson Pimentel deal here, Hanrahan went to Boston with Brock Holt, mm. who has played a big part with the Red Sox this year. Here's Newen Heights, who's had two good at bats today. Singled on a run, fly deep to left center. Kirk getting the start in center field today with Juan Lagares sitting. After playing in the first two days off the disabled list, Anthony Wrecker waits on deck. Remember, the pitcher is in the eight hole behind Wrecker. That's now with five runs and eight hits. Campbell has not shown himself to be anything of a base stealing threat. So the Mets got uh, got as many as they could with Cole on the mound, four stolen bases, three of them for Eric Young and one for Curtis Granderson. Pimentel will do a little better job holding runners. Although he's pretty long to the plate yes. as well. That can't be too happy. Maybe that's the reason that Russell Martin's only thrown out. 25% of the runners. I always think of him as a guy that's around 35% or more. Not a lot of help. Well, it always starts with the pitchers, doesn't it? Yep. Got to give your catcher a chance. If you're just joining us and wondering about the uniforms, it's a Negro League tribute. That's are wearing the uniforms of the Brooklyn Royal Giants, who were prominent. In the first two decades of the 20th century. And the Pirates were in the uniform of the Pittsburgh Crawfords. I like the fact, though, that on the uniform it does not say Crawfords, it says Crawford. Yes, that's after right. After the, uh, the nightclub that you were talking the about. The nightclub, and uh, it's like advertising. I think the owner of the nightclub was. I don't know what the first name was, but Mr. Greenlee, because uh, they used to call the stadium they played in for a while, Greenlee Stadium. Most all the did they have all the pictures of those teams downstairs, downstairs near the food room, the cafeteria, the press dining. One and two to New and Heiss. And Kirk takes one in the dirt, and Campbell took a phantom step towards second, then thought better of it as Stewart blocked it. Well, you get your secondary lead. You think about it, but good choice there by Campbell. Well, with two strikes on New and Heist, the, uh, the Pirates go into the full shift. They were not fully shifted until they got to two strikes, figuring Kirk might want to lay one down. Two two from Pimentel. Campbell runs. Lewenheis strikes out, and Campbell has his first major league stolen base. Five stolen bases today for the Mets. Well, they're all running, and anytime they have a count to run on, they're going. Change up from Pimentel. It fools Newenheis, and the throw not close by Stewart. 
with like four and a half steps by Campbell. That's the difference. It's the third stolen base against Pimentel in just 17 innings of work this year. So the Mets now with five steals, just two shy of a club record. And ties the most they've had in a game this year. They had five in a game in Atlanta back in April. So here's Wrecker. Anthony had got a gift double his last time up, a pop fly to left that Josh Harrison lost in the sun. Pitcher knees on deck. Way Campbell had three steals in Las Vegas this year before he was called up. Now he's first in the majors. Breaking ball for a strike to Recker 0 and 2. Pitchers might start getting a little bit of an advantage here as we move along. The shadows are just starting to play a part and they've got the home plate cover. It's always the downside of playing these late afternoon games. Campbell at second and one out. And Wrecker pops one up. Walker makes the call. Yeah, there are two out. So two out. Campbell is still at second, and John Neese will take his turn. Second time he's come up with a runner in scoring position. We gave the stats, didn't we? One time about the St. Louis Cardinals have used this kind of lineup the most with Tony LaRusso as the manager, and and there was really no difference in the run scored with either lineup. But Hurdle, if memory serves, used his pitcher batting eighth a few times. Yep. See the last year or the year before, but not too many. Managers have dipped their toe in that water. Terry Collins said in spring training he might try it. Took him until the last couple of weeks to actually do it with both DeGrom and Nice. Ball and a strike to John. The biggest downside, as far as I can see, of hitting the pitcher eight is if you're down by a run middle innings and you wouldn't want to hit you for your pitcher, but you might be forced to. Yeah. You have to pinch it for him an inning early. It makes you make a a, a decision one hitter earlier. Right. Say so you have two outs yeah. in that kind of situation. Where you wouldn't otherwise have to bat for your pitcher, but then you do. There's Young hoping for a turn on deck. If not, he becomes that second leadoff hitter the next inning. Pimentel ahead one and two. And he makes contact and fouls it off his leg. In fact, those numbers were 4.9 runs scored when the pitcher batted ninth, Gary, and 4.6 when he batted eighth. So not a big difference, but less when the pitcher was in the eighth slot. And also, I think a small enough sample, and since it's only one team, it's really hard to extrapolate a lot from that. You know, in LaRusse's case, he had a specific purpose both with McGuire and with Pujols batting third to make them into more of a cleanup hitter after their first The second time around. Yeah. Make sure they get up in the first inning, but then potentially have more base runners for them later on. That's especially without David Wright in the lineup, don't really have that imperative. 2 2, strike three call. Lease struck out for the third time today. And the Mets waste the leadoff base runner here in the fifth. Halfway through, 5 to 2, New York.
Five runs in the first two innings against the Pirate Ace and his return from the disabled list. So the Mets have plenty to celebrate with towels and all early on. The sun even playing in the Mets' favor. John Neese getting a key strikeout after giving up a couple of bases loaded walks in the fourth. And now we'll start fresh in the fifth after that very troubled last inning. Working with a 5 to 2 lead against 2, 3, and 4 in the Pittsburgh batting order Jordy Mercer, Andrew McCutcheon, and Gabby Sanchez. The shadows now significantly out in front of home plate. So you got pitcher in sunlight, hitter in shadow, advantage pitcher. And the first pitch curveball misses for ball one. Now, in your experience, Ronnie, yeah. what works best in shadow conditions? Are you better off? Throwing it as hard as you can, you're better off spinning the ball. Not throw it as hard as you can, but I think the fastball up tends to work uh, with the shadows. And then when you get ahead, you can bounce pitches because they just can't see it. If you start it, not only is it coming out of light to dark, but if you start it one place and it ends up another, that's double uh, problem for the hitter. Popped up right near home plate for Wrecker. Mercer spikes the bat and record makes the catch one away. Fastball in just gets under it does Mercer. Wham. I've seen hitters throw that on the ground like that and come up and hit him. <laughs> that would be the last time they would do that. That's right. Well here's McCutcheon who got the whole mess started in the fourth inning with a double to right center. East then struck out Sanchez. Harrison had, had what looked like an innocent infield hit, and then John lost the strike zone, walked three in a row with two of those forcing in runs before he finally righted the ship, striking out Marte and Polanco. Two bases loaded, walks in one inning. First is Frank Francisco. It's a company John would prefer to stay out of. <laughs> Working on his curveball here in the fifth, but he falls behind McCutcheon 3 0. That's Sandra McCutcheon bobblehead day. But he's in a suit. Yeah. You don't very rarely see that with his MVP trophy. That's it, except in the, the trophy. It's probably the suit he wore to the New York Baseball Writers yeah, Dinner, right. which is where they hand out the awards. Very nice. I was asked to hand out uh, the Cy Young to Tim Linscombe one year. It was a joy to do that. It's a great dinner every year. Three and two to McCutcheon. Always have the creme de la creme of the baseball world on hand. They do. For the New York Baseball Writers Dinner. And the uh, writers do the whole thing themselves. Right. And uh, they do a tremendous job putting the whole thing together. Three two from Nice to McCutcheon. Fly ball, right field. And Granderson has an easy play. That's not the Sunfield. And there are two out. It's the best way to start your weekday. Catch the crew on the Pix 11 Morning News, where every story hits home. So two out and nobody on. Gabby Sanchez is fly to left and struck out. Talking about the fact that the Mets are going to Atlanta for three games starting on Monday. One thing to keep an eye on Evan Gaddis came out of last night's game after suffering back spasms, mm. and they're not sure what his status is. One on one to Sanchez. It's eight straight headers now for John that he started the count with a ball. Not a recommended path. No. Line the other way, and Sanchez gets it down in the right field corner. They go for two and make it easily with an opposite field double. Well, it's only a matter of time with Gabby Sanchez against the Mets. Yeah, you just hope no one's on base, which was the case there. Trying to come inside leaves it up and away. So a two out double for Sanchez. It's a case that the hitter's not really trying to go the other way. He's just a little late on that ball up in the strike zone. So 
So five hits now against these. So here's Harrison. He bounced one near the second base bag that went for an infield hit on the fourth. And the changeup is up and away for ball one. Harrison playing left field today. Starling Marte again out of the lineup, although Marte did pinch hit in that last inning and took a call third strike. 2 0 now to Harrison with Neil Walker on deck. Drilled toward the right field corner, back toward the wall, foul. just foul. Well, Harrison was that close to an extra base hit and driving in a run. And he might not have even had to dodge traffic to get a triple. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it's become a slog for John Neese. An afternoon that started brilliantly with a 5 0 lead, three easy innings, has degenerated into a survival mode. 85th pitch of the day coming up for John. 2 1. Harrison pulls it toward the hole, smothered by Campbell. That'll keep a run from scoring, but it's another infield hit for Harrison. That ball gets by Campbell, then Sanchez scores. He was able to keep it on the infield. Well, whenever there's two outs and a guy in second, you always want a dive to keep the ball in the infield. But Campbell on that one almost looks like he dove over the ball. And that's why he didn't catch it in the webbing. See how he catches that right up against his wrist. So a couple of two out hits for the Pirates, and that'll get the tying run to the plate with Neil Walker. Walker drew the first of those three consecutive walks that Nice gave up in the fourth inning. Sanchez at third, no speed. Harrison at first, very good speed. And Pirates are now in a mode where Harrison would think about a steal, but Nice is very hard to run on. With one stolen base against him this year. Walker hits it out to right. That'll slice and go foul. Notice by Sanchez and Harrison and Walker here, a little thought of hitting the ball to right field off Nice. Well, he's got the answer. He run that cutter yeah. inside, but he's had trouble throwing that for strikes today. Got the one key call against Marte in the last inning. That will chase on Sanchez. And the Met lead is cut to five to three. 37th run batted in for Walker. Three straight two out hits for the Pirates to get them within two. Well, very disappointing when you're John Neese. You got the first two outs of the inning and you can't finish the inning off. Fastball in, not a lot on it. And the Z that they feature here. In Pittsburgh, the Z for Pittsburgh, and the Mets have their towels. Well, Pittsburgh started with a P. That's right. Carlos Torres up in the Mets bullpen. Here's Alvarez with the tying runs on base. Alvarez drew a bases loaded walk in the fourth. And the first pitch curve is off the plate for ball one. Well, John Neese has given up three earned runs today. If he gives up another, that would bring an end to his streak of 19 straight starts, allowing three earned runs or less. Right now, he just wants to get out of the fifth inning alive. Well, the knees to Alvarez, 2 and 0. Mechanically, he's doing a, a couple things wrong, Gary. Uh, Kevin was mentioning about the Grom. Flying open with that shoulder, that's one. But we've seen him a couple times. His follow through takes him into the grass part. That means that you're not staying back either. So those two things are, are the result of why he's had a hard time throwing strikes. 3 0. Well, 
would Clint Hurdle give his slugger a green light on three and out? Would Chris do it up next? Absolutely. This is your one chance, not one chance, but it's a chance to get not even back into the game ahead. 3 0, swinging, he fouls it off, so there you go. That's the call. Clint, this entire series has been aggressive. We saw him call the pitch out. We've seen hit and run when it's a bunt situation. The only thing that mitigates against that for Alvarez is that he's struggled so much against lefties, but Arnold had faith in him. Now he'll be back in there at 3 and 1. Tying runs aboard with two out. And it's hit right at the shortstop. Tejada will go to first with it. And that retires the side. But the Pirates get a little closer. Three two out hits combined to score a run. 5 3 New York after five. To City Field for a concert after the Mets Marlins game Saturday, July 12th, as part of the Mets concert series presented by Dwayne Reed. Catch Huey Lewis in the news live in concert July 12th. For tickets, visit Mets.com slash concerts. Well, it has been a rather frustrating couple of innings for John Neese. He's seen a 5 0 lead and dissolve into a 5 3 margin. It's frustrating for him, it's frustrating for the team. John's at 92 pitches through five innings and heading up the tunnel. And we'll see whether he'll be back. You and I disagreed. Uh, you think he's going to stay in, or maybe less now because we showed, showed that shot. And I, I think that um, some games you don't deserve to stay in there anymore, and I think that might be the case with Terry Collins. There are only two reasons I thought that he might get the sixth inning. Eric Young leads off in the top of the sixth and swings over the breaking ball from Pimentel. One is that you got the bottom part of the order coming up the eight and nine hitters and the other is the Mets used four and a third out of their bullpen last night. Yeah I mean that, that would make sense but I know that managers sometimes just get frustrated when. Their pitchers don't throw strikes. Young drags a bunt, but right to Gabby Sanchez couldn't be easier for Gabby. First time Young's been retired today. One out of the sixth. Good idea poor execution mm. for EY. So Curtis Granderson will bat with one out Curtis who came into this series red hot 0 for 2 today 0 for 10 in the three games he did walk steal the base and score a run in the second. That's got three in the first and two in the second off Garrett Cole and they've had chances since but un have been unable to tack on and the Pirates have been able to creep closer. Pimentel working his second inning of relief. There's the ice cream, and then, well, then there's the toppings. Topping uh, like like a salad bar, right? I mean, a toppings bar has everything. M&Ms. 
I don't know who started the idea of the toppings. Yeah. I mean, it used to be there was it was chocolate syrup, maybe some butterscotch, yeah, and sprinkles. Jimmy's, or, or Jimmy's as you yeah. call them in New England, and that was it. Now, Heath bars and peanut M and M's and gummy bears, Oreo cookies, yeah, shards. Pop up off the bat of Granderson into foul territory comes Sanchez, and there are two out. I mean, kids today have a much, much more diverse world of, of ice cream nourishment. Doesn't mean it's better. I think it's one of the simpler. It was. What were you, a butterscotch guy, chocolate guy, a strawberry guy? Um, as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. I was not a toppings guy. Oh. What I was very much in favor of was the Carvel Cherry Bonnet. Okay. Very the, nice. fro the frozen cherry bonnet, where you have to peel. Yeah. The, the bonnet off the ice cream with your teeth because <laughs> it was so hard. <laughs> As an adult, though, the simple pint of vanilla Hagen dazs That was you. Yeah. Hagen dazs very nice. Seal test where I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> they had to draw one foul, and it's one of one. You? I was uh, uh, where I grew up, where you get your ice cream usually is Friendly's. Was a uh, was a big chain, and. Uh, they had the Jim Dandy, which was like the uh, uh, banana split times a thousand kind of deal. Mm -hmm. But mine was always two toppings, and it didn't matter the ice cream. Two toppings, strawberry and marshmallow. Really? Yes. So out there. I know. It it's, makes no sense. To this day, if I had ice cream, and I don't have ice cream too much, um, certainly would go back with that. So you like the marshmallow on the ice cream. Did you also do the fluffernutter? No fluffernutter. No, we saved that for the peanut butter. <laughs> one two from Jim and Tell, and Tejada takes one that just misses. I mean, the only time we have ice cream, I've ever seen you have ice cream, is when I have ice cream in Philadelphia. Right. The Turkey Hill ice cream in the Philadelphia ballpark. Muddy sneakers. The preferred variety. Slowly hit. Alvarez in to grab it. Side retired. The rare one, two, three in it for Stormy Pimentel or anybody else today. Five three New York in the sixth. Brought to you by Honda. Start something special with a great deal on a Honda. Now at your Honda dealer. Looking out from the ballpark and across to downtown Pittsburgh, there's Pops, Willie Stargell. They're great with the statues here in Pittsburgh. They are. Although I'd say they shortchanged Ralph a little bit. They left out the rest of them and only have a statue of his hands. They were inspired by Rodin, I think, when they went with the Ralph statue. <laughs> 
John Neese soldiers on. Chris Stewart helps him out, swinging at the first pitch. Ruben Tejada throws out Stewart. One pitch and one away for Neese in the home sixth. You were right, Gary. I was wrong. Jonathan out there for another inning. Now how about this? Clint Hurdle's going to let his relief pitcher, Stormy Pimentel, take a turn at bat. So that helps Neese out even further. Pimentel's already got two innings at in long relief. What do you think about this move? Well, I think with if the runner had hitter had gotten on Stewart, I think he would have thought differently, or he would have bunted him over. Um, so what he's trying to do is say, Pimentel's throwing well. He's going to hold him, and he can hold him for a couple more innings. And I'm going to trust that the top our order is going to get it going. Well, this gives Nice a little better crack at getting through this sixth inning. You got Gregory Blanco waiting on deck. Chopper to the right side. Duda makes the flip, has to reach back, does Nice. But they make the 3 1 play for the second out. He always falls through to the third base side, but good hustle to get over there. All you got to do is beat the pitcher. And the good concentration to field that ball behind him. So, two quick outs for Nice, who's had very few reasons to smile lately. Now we'll face Polanco with the bases empty. Polanco getting the start against the lefty today on a day and I think Clint Hurdle would have preferred to rest him. But with starting Marte still not available to start. He felt he had to keep Polanco in the lineup and Polanco has gone 0 for 3 a couple of strikeouts and a ground out. Now just 3 for 22 against left handed pitching. He has been spectacular against right handers as the Mets have seen in this series. One thing I've noticed, and I'm sure Bartolo is pitching tomorrow has noticed it. Polanco is pretty set on taking that first pitch every at bat. Chop to Tejada. And he throws out Polanco, and Nice gets the extra inning of work and throws just six pitches to get three ground balls and quickly through it. On to the seventh, 5 3 New York. By Chevrolet, visit ChevyDealer.com. That's took the early 5 0 lead against Garrett Cole. John Neese gave three of those runs back, but he pitched a very effective sixth inning, and now his work is done. Gets the firm handshake from Terry Collins. So after 98 pitches over six innings, Neese has his 20th straight start in which he gives up three earned runs or fewer. Longest current streak in the major leagues, and he's got a little more reason to smile than he did a couple of innings ago. <laughs> well, what happens a lot of times, your manager will go, Hey, by the way, what, what happened in that inning? And usually your answer is, Well, if I knew, I would have uh, changed it immediately. <laughs> well, John's next start will be against the powerful Texas Rangers. 
probably on July 4th, Friday night. Daniel Murphy one for three today, a two run single back in the second. And Stormy Pimentel working his third inning of relief misses low one and one. Is there a day off on? Uh, no, there isn't. So yeah. Sunday, Monday, yeah, day off. Thursday's a day off. Okay, yeah. so that makes sense. So if the Rangers have a day off, it'll be Nice Darvish. Darvish is pitching today. Yes, he is. The Mets will probably miss Nick Tepish, who pitched yesterday. In that series, of course, it's been such an injury-plagued year for Texas. I think they have 14 players on the disabled list. And it's one of the reasons why their record is uh, well, it's about the same as the Mets. Yeah. Seven games under 500 coming into play today. But they still have uh, a lot of threats in that lineup: Shin Su Chu and Adrian Beltre. Hold down to first, and Gabby Sanchez handles it. Murphy retired one away. That's seven in a row retired by Pimentel without the ball leaving the infield. One out, Duda coming up. Let's check in with Kevin. Well, as we wait on the news of David Wright, guys, it's interesting to look at who is doing well infielder wise in the Mets farm system, right? I mean, we know some of the names of there Wil Wilmer Flores, certainly Josh Satin, guys like that. But there's a guy that's kind of been on fire this year by the name of Matt Reynolds. The Mets took him in 2012 in the second round out of Arkansas. And it's been a pretty meteoric rise through the system. I mean, when you consider that last year he had 226 in St. Lucie and finishes the year there. And then look at this year in double A. Hit 355 with a 430 on base. So he forced a promotion. And so far in triple A, it's early, but he's crushing it. 429, he's got six doubles, five multi hit games already. You know, I was speaking with John Ricco, and he said, yeah, you know, we certainly vision moving up but he kind of forced our hand the way he's been going the book on him is he's a doubles hitter he's got some pop defensively though the big question we've heard this before can he be a shortstop I've been told he's better defensively at short than Flores but the Mets are playing him at second now they're going to play him at third they're going to keep him versatile in that role and one scout called him or a comparison to him Randy Velarde which is interesting so he's got some offensive firepower that's for sure he's not on the 40 man roster yet though guys so uh, bottom line is he's got to look out for a guy that could be added later in the year and maybe we see him at some point. Good call Kevin. Although I think that if uh, you know if David is out for any significant period of time Flores would be the first call. Sure the problem you run into though is if they don't have to DL right if it's just going to be yeah. five or six days. Flores hasn't been down in the minors for 10 days, and you can only bring him back before 10 days if you put somebody on the disabled list. So then you run into a little bit of a crunch there. And Flores, by the way, they moved him last night to third base just to get him some reps there in case the Mets need to call him up. Two and two now to Duda as that one just missed. Lucas one for three, singled and scored back in the first. Well. I'm sure that Clint Hurdle is just beside himself because that's about the pitch that the was called on Marte. <laughs> I was looking at some of the stats Clint as he was trying to get back to the major leagues after uh, not failing in Kansas City but not working out for him in Kansas City because his teammate in 1983 with the Tidewater Tides he had 105 RBI that year. I mean an amazing year. And a great teammate. No surprise that he's become one of the better managers. Had a long tenure in Colorado. Due to down on strikes, Mark Pimentel has looked terrific. Gave up a hit to Campbell. Now he's retired eight in a row without the ball leaving the infield. Well, he was always the starting pitcher in the minor leagues with the Red Sox. And that's the role that he can play. But here, where the Pirates only has been a reliever and very sharp today. He's been a classic long man here. Hurdle left him in for a turn at bat in the last half inning, working his third inning. Here's Campbell, who was the first man to face him. Eric's had a good day today two for three, a single and a double. His first big league stolen base, an RBI run scored. Goes after Cutter and misses, nothing in one. I was thinking that Campbell might look the best in that uniform, and I'm wondering because he has a little. Lighter color on his shoes, maybe. Mm. Now, Kirk Neuenheis is on deck. I believe Kirk is wearing stirrups. Yes. Which might work a little bit better with that uniform. Let's see, uh, Campbell's got the. Uh, what are they, like a soccer sock? And blue it? socks. But see, Neuenheis has the old fashioned stirrups, which is, of course, 
what you would expect to see with an old time uniform. Oh, and two to Campbell. I think um, Travis Darno is going with the stirrups today as well, because he hasn't been in the game. It's probably fun for those guys to change it up a little bit. This whole generation grew up never having worn stirrups, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. One two to Campbell, and that rides inside. Two and two. From Pimentel at a full count. Tried to paint him there, didn't get the call from Bazer. Looked like it was up and away. Talk about dialing it up. What? So throwing 92, 93, all of a sudden 98. Drill to left center field, an extra base hit for Campbell. That'll go all the way back near the 410 mark. Campbell takes a turn at second and holds on there with his third hit of the day his second double. So Campbell filling in for the captain and he's had a big afternoon. Well, remember last week when he was. Playing some first base for Lucas Duda he had seemed like he was having a hit or a couple of hits every day. And again today three more knocks. He's got a very level compact swing. Now Eric Campbell's now had 75 major league at bats. He's in 307. So he's had a nice run. Here's Newenheis, and they're going to walk him intentionally and go after Wrecker instead. So Newenheis, one for three at RBI, another well hit ball. We'll have the bat taken out of his hands. And the Mets will have two on for Wrecker. Newenheis has made an impression on Hurdle already. Murphy provided a little scouting report to Wrecker about Stolme Pimentel. Now Murph grounded out to the first baseman. Do you listen to a guy who made an out against a guy? Or is he just giving him, he's got a little sink on his pitch, he's got a little slider? Well, also, you, you certainly don't expect Pimentel to pitch a right hand hitter like Wrecker the same way he pitched a lefty right. like Murphy, but. Murph might have the scouting report memorized. <laughs> well, Wrecker is going to probably get Pimentel from most of the right handed hitters. He's led them off with a slider. He did that with Campbell. Well, the Mets with two outs today are six for 12, wow. including Campbell's double a moment ago. Mets have had ample opportunities to tack on after taking an early 5 0 lead. And now another presents itself. Wrecker hit a fly ball to left that fell in for a double when Josh Harrison lost it in the sun back in the third. That's his only hit today, one for three. Two on and two out. Wrecker goes after that first pitch slider, nothing won. Pitch out of the strike zone, but good break by Pimentel. You know, we were watching McCutcheon with that hat. I just think it's not the player's fault that the hats are a little different for the, the Pittsburgh team. Not really formed. Eric Young was on deck, but he's not the on deck hitter. It's that confusion with the pitcher yeah. batting eights. So now Bobby Abreu has come out on deck to be a pinch hitter. That's right, it's your turn. <laughs> a little confusion there. You certainly wouldn't want to bat out of order. That can get you in trouble. <laughs> Seen a team get caught for batting out of order in a long time. It does happen occasionally, though. There are more pages in the rule book devoted to teams batting out That's of order right. than to anything else. Yeah, and it never happens. Exactly. Page after page, but this guy bats and that guy bats, then this is the result, and take this. It's, it's crazy. And the proto protocol for what you do after you find out when it has to be announced. Pops one foul. Well, the, the rule of thumb on batting out of order is A, if you are the opposing manager, you don't call it to anybody's attention, it's over. They bat out of order in something 
happens. Yes. That gets a hit or it hits a home run or whatever it is. Sometimes you'll wait till later in the game. And the rule of thumb for the umpire is that the person who was supposed to bat a proper batter is out. So sometimes you'll get a guy who bats out of order, gets a hit, somebody else is called out, and the guy who just got the hit is the batter. Bat again, yeah. 2 2 coming to record. And it's wide, ball three. So now a full count to record with two men on. And McCutcheon's still trying to figure out that hat. Well, it's not a, a formed like the Mets hat. You know, it's kind of. Uh, it looks like it didn't get out of the box until the last second. <laughs> Campbell and Neuenheis get set to run. Sanchez was about to sneak in behind Neuenheis at first, now backs off. 3 2 coming to record. Struck him out with a slider. So Pimentel gets himself out of a jam. He's thrown three scoreless innings in relief to keep his team in the game. Seventh inning stretch, 5 3 New York. Enjoy better. That's enjoyed the first inning. Eric Campbell drove in a run with a double. A wild pitch brought in a second run. That's a very wild pitch. <laughs> Kirk Newen Heights had a base hit to drive in a third run, and the Mets were off and running against Garrett Cole, who would then give up two runs in the second inning as well. But the Mets have been unable to attack on. It's now a five to three Met lead as we go to the bottom of the seventh. Terry Collins makes a double switch. Juan Magaris comes in to play center field. He'll that eighth where the pitcher had been. Ewan Heights comes out and Jerry's Familia will pitch and hit six. Yeah, he got two outs in last night's ball game in the 11th, 11 inning thriller. He uh, got Andrew McCutcheon to ground out and Neil Walker to fly out. Well, John Neese leaves with a 5 to 3 lead. He's got only himself to kick for turning 5 nothing into 5 3. But John has only four wins this year, and a big part of that is the fact that he has not had a lot of support from the guys behind him in the bullpen. Yeah, the bullpen's ERA is uh, 4.27 in his games. They're four and three, and only four for six save opportunities. So, see if that can change today with Familia. Familia will get two, three, and four in the order: Mercer, McCutcheon, and Sanchez. Three right-hand batters do up. Keep in mind that. Colin Hurdle has two left handed bats on his bench Ike Davis and Travis Snyder both of whom started last night. Mercer one for three had an infield hit back in the first has popped up twice since then. And Familia fires one just out of the strike zone for ball one. Difference for me when I look at Familia and why he's turned the page is that. 
he's, he doesn't care about strikeouts. He throws strikes. He wants them to put it in play. Uses that good sinker. If he gets ahead, then he'll go with the slider. Chopper for Tejada comes up nicely for him, and he throws out his counterpart Mercer one away. Well, if you've got a 97 mile an hour sinker, why would you ever have to throw anything else? Well, what happens though is that when you throw as hard as he does, it, you can almost equate it to a guy who's a big guy who's a line drive hitter. They want him to hit home runs. When you're a guy who throws 97, they want you to strike out people. Well, with that sinker, he's not that kind of pitcher. They're going to put it in play. He doesn't strike out as many as you would think for a guy who throws that hard. Well, his problem, at least early in the season, was throwing strikes. Yeah. And, you know, with the movement he has and the velocity that he has, he should have fast innings. Here's McCutcheon. He takes a slider out of the strike zone. McCutcheon, one for three, doubled to start that, that uh, two on fourth inning for the Pirates. Gabby Sanchez, due up next, but that's Ike Davis on deck to bat for him. And lifts one in the shallow right. Easy for Granderson. And there are two out. So four pitches, two outs for Familia. New York Mets baseball is brought to you by Kia. So now two out, and Mike Davis will bat for Gabby Sanchez and a lefty righty switch. Mike still looking for his first hit against his old team. He's 0 for 6 in this series, 0 for 13 against the Mets this year. Do you hear the same music I'm hearing? <laughs> so it's like, Is that from the riverboat? A riverboat, ice cream truck, I don't know. I drives one deep center field. Lagaris back to the warning track. Makes the catch. Lagaris just into the game and he shows off. A long run to get to Ike Davis's fly ball. If he's not a gold glove center fielder, I've never seen one. Familiar, very happy. Lagaris, five pitch inning for Familiar. With an easy inning made easier by the long strides of Juan Lagares. Well, he's playing Ike Davis shaded to left center field. And watch how far he goes. All the way to the catch up bottle. Made it look easy. And that's the thing about Lagares. He does not make a lot of out and out spectacular catches. Like the catch McCutcheon made last night against Granderson looked more spectacular, but he didn't go nearly as far as Lagares just did. 
given the trajectory of the ball. Yeah, no, uh, McCutcheon uh, plays a very deep center field. So his thing is, you know, he doesn't mind giving up the base hits in front of him, but his strength is, uh, you know, being deep and playing the balls, uh, making sure they rob them off the wall. The Garris does both. You know, it's almost a uh, horrible to say, but I mean, you know, McCutcheon's an MVP player, all around player. Ligaris is the best center fielder. And I see a lot of teams uh, in the game right now. Checks the swing, but he holds it in time. Two and one. Ligaris came into the double switch in that half inning. He's sitting in the eighth spot. Eric Young on deck, then Curtis Granderson. As the Mets try and crack through against Stolme Pimentel, who starts his fourth inning of relief. He has been tremendous so far, keeping the Pirates in the game. Two to I'm including Trout and Carlos Gomez and whoever else, else you want to use. To me, Gomez is the only guy who's close yeah. because he, like Lagares, he covers an enormous amount of ground. But he plays deep also. Yes, he does. But he'll make diving catches in the gaps and coming in. The thing about Juan is that he's less spectacular than Gomez, but I think he. He takes away more than Gomez does. You know, when I was young, uh, Kurt Flood was a uh, considered one of the best center fielders. Paul Blair, um, when he was in Baltimore, and the Yanks, uh, was one of the best. Garris down on strikes. That's five strikeouts in relief now for Pimentel. 14 swing and misses, Pimentel, since he's been in the game. I mean, that's a good number if you pitch the whole game 14. I always said that Willie Mays was the best center fielder I, I ever saw. I didn't really see him play, right? You know? So, I, that, but I was a kid then. Yeah. The guy that I've watched the most, that I have the most respect for defensively, was was Andrew Jones. I mean, Andrew, you know, we'd see him 18 times yeah. a year playing against the Mets, and he liked Lagares would play very shallow and would, had. And like Lagares never made diving catches. He just he got to everything. Well, and he always uh, made that clutch play. You know, you, you would have a batter up, you'd have two on or the bases loaded, they would rocket something in the in the gap, and he would just come up with it every single time, which was a, a game changer. And like Lagares, Andrew Jones had the great arm in center field, which you don't see a lot. You know, center fielders tend not to be the best arms. Usually that's in right field. If they have the speed, they don't have the arm, usually. Now, the best center fielder's arm I've ever seen was Rick Ankeel. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> he was amazing. 0 2 to Eric Young, and he goes down. And Pimentel is just dominating the Mets. Six strikeouts and three and two thirds of relief. Looks like it's a split finger change up or but nasty. Well, Pimentel has really bailed out the Pirates this afternoon after Garrett Kel Cole managed just four innings. Here's Granderson 0 for 3 in a walk today. Curtis takes a slider for ball one. Granderson walked, stole a base, scored a run in the second, but now 0 for 11 in this series. The Mets five runs and nine hits. The Pirates three runs and seven hits. Familia was able to negotiate the three and four hitters in the last inning. And had such an easy time of it. He'll go back out there for the bottom of the eighth. One and two to Granderson. Yeah, it is a split finger seeing it come out of his fingers. It'll be interesting to see how many more split fingers we see this year and especially next year. In the wake of Tanaka's success? The Tanaka factor or manifesto. One and two to Granderson. And that splitter just missed. Two and two.
Big hands. Has that ball in between those two fingers. He's got a good one. But what makes it even better is that he has the ability to throw, as we've seen, 98 miles an hour occasionally. Well, the Pirates picked him up, as we mentioned, from the Red Sox in the Joel Hanrahan trade, and something of a diamond in the rough. And Pimentel has been priceless for the Pirates today. 2 2. Flies into the upper deck. I don't think that area ever sees a baseball. <laughs> That's where that ball went. I just turned that almost all the way around. Eighth pitch of the at bat coming from Pimentel to Granderson. And he got him. Pimentel strikes off the side in the eighth inning. That's seven strikeouts and four innings of relief for Stolme Pimentel. Now Familia back to the mound for the bottom of the eighth with a two run lead. A's have gone in front of the Marlins 6 5 as they go to the ninth. Alberto Casper, the go ahead hit. Carlos Gomez hit a three run homer in the first inning. The Brewers, who have their best record ever through 82 games with 50 wins, leading the Rockies 7 4 in the eighth. And first of a day night doubleheader, Gio Gonzalez with seven scoreless innings as the Nationals beat the Cubs 3 0. Jerry's familiar through just five pitches in a 1 2 3 seventh inning. They'll face Josh Harrison leading off in the home eighth. Harrison two for three, a pair of infield hits today. He's now four for nine in this series. It'll be Harrison, then Neil Walker, and Pedro Alvarez for the Pirates in the home eighth. And a slider in for a strike to Harrison. John Neese went the first six, allowed three runs and seven hits. There's Walker on deck. That's trying to snap a three game losing streak, a game in which they had a 5 0 lead after an inning and a half. Toward the hole, Tejada on the back end against the speed of Harrison gets him easily. One out. Be sure to tune in to Pix 11 on Tuesday, July 8th, when the Mets take on the Braves at 7 p.m. Tuesday, the 8th, on New York's own Pix 11. Torres, the right hander, Danny Evil, the left hander, staying busy in the Mets bullpen. It's an open question as to whether Henry Mejia is available for today's game. 35 pitches yesterday in two innings. And most of those with heavy lifting involved. Worked out of that second and third, nobody out yet. Here's Walker, is one for two in a walk. And he cracks one and looked deep left field, get turned around, but Eric Young gets back there and makes the catch. Nice recovery by EY who spun the wrong way but still made the grab. 
you know the one thing you could do is if Familia can keep his pitch count down again a classic three up three inning save. Well he's faced five batters and thrown eight pitches that's uh, that's a pretty good job of keeping your pitch count down. Meanwhile in the Pirates bullpen their newest addition Ernesto Frieri has begun to throw Frieri acquired yesterday in the uh, trade of the failed closers with Jason Grilly going to Anaheim. Grilly's ERA was mid fours for Yeri's in the six. But Grilly's age 37 for Yeri 28. That's the way it works for the Pirates. So here's Pedro Alvarez 0 for 2. Also has drawn a walk to four center run. The Pirates got two of their runs on bases loaded walks from John Neese in the fourth inning when things just fell apart for John. He then gave up three straight two out hits to bring in a run in the fifth. To make this a closer game. You see what Familia's done lately, just complete dominance. Yeah. Whip under one over the last month. That's a good slider. One and one to Alvarez. Oh, a nasty pitch by Familia. You're looking for that fastball away, and he bends it down and in. He is truly. Royal Giant. <laughs> Quick <Pick> pitch. <laughs> We're both saying it now. It's the Latroy. Rector had his mask knocked off by the foul ball. I think there's also something to be said, and Terry didn't know how exactly to address it, and I don't either. But I think there's a kinship of brotherhood between Mejia and Familia in the in the bullpen. You know, the uh, competition, a good competition, and a friendship. One two. Got him. Strike three call. Alvarez caught looking. Six up and six down for Familia and he does it in short order. Twelve pitches to get him through two innings. Five three New York after eight. The edge in this game, a 5 0 lead before things got dicey. Yeah, Walker had something to celebrate. So did the Pierogies. Huh. Must have been able to hang on to their lead. With the great relief pitching of Jerry's Familia, two easy innings. They played some splashy defense as well. And they take a 5 3 lead into the ninth inning. And they'll face the newest Pirate. Ernesto Frieri just acquired yesterday from the Angels. Well, Frieri is a guy who made quite a splash after, after getting traded from San Diego over to the Angels. Um, he was as good as they got and just struggled a lot with not his control really, but he was a guy that never gave up any hits in 33 and 31 innings pitch this year. 37 saves last year, 11 this year, but eight home runs in 31 innings, the downfall for Frieri. 
They'll face Tejada, Murphy, and Duda in the ninth inning. You figure this might be Frieri's day. Ernesto Frieri is a native and one of the few in the major leagues from Colombia. And Colombia defeated Uruguay in the round of 16 in the World Cup today. So very good. Frieri is already flying high. Orlando Cabrera was he from Colombia? He was so was uh, Edgar Renteria. Okay. Tejada one for three and a walk today, and he hits one toward the hole. Mercer on the back end, tough play, jump throw, got it. Beautiful play, Jordy Mercer. Boy, he has a lot more range than you think he has. Won the good backhand, the plant, and got a lot on that throw. Jumping like Jeter. Well, think about it. As someone that's Mercer's age, and Derek just celebrated his 40th birthday, he probably practiced that play in the backyard hundreds of times. So one tough out for Ernesto Frieri. I'm sure he got defense played like that behind him in Anaheim. Here's Murph. One for four, a two run single back in the second, and he fouls off the first one he sees. So Stolmy Pimentel saved the Pirates' bacon today, went four innings in relief, allowed no runs, two hits, an intentional walk, and seven strikeouts. It's about as good a long relief outing as we've seen in a long time. Got 17 swings and misses in four innings. That's what some pitchers get in, in nine innings. Murphy lifts one to left and Harrison gliding over. Two out. Looking ahead to the bottom of the ninth. The Pirates will have eight, nine, and one of the order. That's Stewart, the pitcher's spot, and Polanco. They would have to get two men on to get McCutcheon to the plate. Now the question is who's going to pitch that bottom of the ninth for the Mets? Would you give Familia the third inning? I personally would give him the third inning, but it looks like Henry Mejia is up throwing. So obviously he feels fine to come in. After going two innings in last night's game. A crazy Ernesto Frieri, his first appearance for the Pittsburgh Pirates is not in their uniform. That is odd. <laughs> Watch how he hides the ball behind his back leg. Very unusual. Just drops it straight down. And that deception is something that really served him well until this year. Duda's one for four today, singled back in the first inning. Well, here's the way I look at it, and it does look as though Mejia is going to pitch the bottom of the ninth, and that's his job as the closer. But Mejia went two stormy innings. Last night, 35 pitches. Familiar went to tiptoe through the yeah. tulips innings oh, oh. today. Tiny Tim reference. 12 pitches and two nice. innings. I would, I would err on the side of letting Familiar start the night if I were making that call. Well, I think there's also the protection factor. 35 pitches thrown by Mejia last night. Uh, this might be one of those games you don't want to get him into. Right. Well, certainly there was a question in Terry Collins' mind before the game as to whether Mejia would be available. Now, Mejia hadn't pitched in six days before last night, so I'm sure that factors into it as well. Still 35 pitches under duress is 35 pitches. But Henry has told Terry he wants to pitch more often. Mm -hmm. Outside, full count to Duda. Or Campbell is on deck. That's five runs and nine hits. The Pirates three runs and seven hits were in the ninth. Three two from Frieri. Drilled to right field. Polanco over and makes the leaping grab with a lot of white show. <laughs> Caught half the ball, but it counts as the whole ball. Had it all the way. We were talking about ice cream earlier, weren't we? That's some good humor right there for Polanco.
a three game losing streak carry a five to three lead and Henry Mejia who worked two scoreless innings last night back for more today. Thirty five pitches a couple of hits a walk and four strikeouts for Henry in last night's ball game. Here he comes into a save chance last night he was brought into a tie game in the bottom of the ninth which is something you rarely do on the road but um, it was one of those circumstances where Henry had pitched in six days and Terry Collins felt he had to get him into the game no matter what and that was the place he chose. Now they'll get eight nine and one in the Pirates batting order that's Chris Stewart the pitcher spot with Travis Snyder on deck to pinch hit, and then Gregory Polanco so right left left against Mejia in the bottom of the ninth. Jerry's familia could not have been better six batters face six batters retired one terrific catch by Lagaris helping him out in his two perfect innings of relief. <laughs> Stewart Anthony Wrecker backup catchers they know the drill commiserating. How's your thumb? So he took a shot earlier. Stewart's 0 for 2, drove in a run with a bases loaded walk in the fourth inning. Barrett's got two in the fourth and one in the fifth off John Neese, who's in line for his fifth win if Mejia can seal the deal. And Mejia starts him off with a fastball strike. Wearing the uniforms of the Brooklyn Royal Giants. <laughs> they were Negro League Giants back in the first two decades of the 20th century. As Mejia quick pitches one outside, one and one. That's have previously worn the uniforms of the New York Cubans, right. but they've never worn this uniform before, so they would be undefeated in these togs. If Mejia can nail it down, Stewart hits one out to center. Lagaris easing back, one away. So one out in the last of the ninth. Coming up next here on Picks 11, it's Family Guy, and over on SNY, it's WB Mason post game line. There's Travis Snyder to pinch hit for the pitcher. Snyder got a start in left field last night with 0 for 5 with a couple of strikeouts. Including one in a big spot against Mejia. Chop toward third. Campbell's got it. Two out. Well, I'll tell you, down by two runs, how do you not take a pitch there? The guys in today's game don't do it, and uh, it's a shame. Doesn't make any sense. Snyder up there swinging, and now he's made Mejia's life that much easier. Two out and nobody on. Gregory Polanco. The only way I would say you have to swing is if you're facing Kimbrel at his best or Araldis Chapman, where you just can't afford to take a pitch. Henry, not in that group yet. The last nine Pittsburgh hitters. Have been retired on a total of 18 pitches. Here's Polanco 0 for 4 with the Pirates down to their final out. He takes a first pitch strike. The Mets have retired what? 12 in a row? 12 in a row. The last hit was Walker's single that drove in a run in the fifth. The Millie was perfect for two, and Mejia trying to finish off a perfect night. 0 and 1 to Polanco. In the dirt. 1 and 1. Blanco can get aboard. Jordy Mercer would be next. Pirates need to get two men on to get Andrew McCutcheon to bat. First at bat today for Polanco against a right hand pitcher. He went 0 for 4 against Nice. Gets one off the fist to foul ball, and it's one and two. So now the Pirates are down to their final strike. <laughs> the 
but he had one and two. Slap to third. Short hop for Campbell. And the ball game is over. Henry Mejia with a 1 2 3 ninth. The Met pitching staff combines to retire the last 13 Pirates in a row. And the five early runs are enough. Eric Campbell with three hits. John Neese gets a win. And the Mets snap a three game losing streak as they beat the Pirates 5 to 3. Well, the Mets were great through their blue period this afternoon in the. Royal Giants Terry Collins crew a much needed win Mejia just as good as he was last night. Jonathan Neese wasn't his best today but he got through six innings and continues his streak of 20 straight starts three earned runs or less and Familia was just dominated. You know, the Mets with bullpen we featured it during the beginning of our broadcast today and it continues to be an enormous help to this team just as much as the bullpen hurt them early in the season. It is a huge asset now on a day that John Neese had to stagger through his last few innings. Familiar and Mejia.